All right, I'd like to call to order the September 22nd, 2008 Board of Selectmen meeting. If we can please rise uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Anything else about the system? Okay, uh, first item on the agenda uh, is announcement. I'm going to put you on a spot, Peter, because you do know more about this than I do. Uh, you left me a voicemail just the other day, and um, I guess we had a loss at, at OLV. Uh, it was yes, yes, we did, uh, although I don't. As far as the history, I don't know a lot. Sister Kathleen died last week. Um, she'd been ill for a while. Uh, a, a tremendous loss to the town of Uxbridge and to Our Lady of the Valley School and education in general. Um, I, I know her only tangentially. My wife knew her more. Um, people who have gone to Our Lady of the Valley, of course, would, would know her. Uh, so she'll be missed. Um, the, 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 the amount of work that uh, Catholic nuns have done in the area of education of children in America is a story that yet to be told. But they've done a tremendous amount and um, we're the better for it. We'll miss her. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? All right, uh, as we move on to uh, Citizens Forum, I just want to kind of preface Citizens Forum uh, moving forward from now on that uh, we are going to keep speakers uh, to a maximum of five minutes each. Uh, Citizens Forum has taken on uh, quite a bit of time uh, recently and uh, just out of interest for, you know, hearings and other agenda items, uh, I do want to, you know, hold each speaker to no more than five minutes. So uh, if, if I can see by show of hands who's interested in speaking at Citizens Forum. Okay. All right. Sorry. What up? Yep, sure. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I am Lisa O'Hearn, and I am the committee chair for Cub Scout PAC 25 here in Uxbridge. I come to you today to ask if we may have a Halloween parade for our PAC on Sunday, October 19th at 2 o'clock, gathering at the town common and parading to OLV. I've talked to Chief Freitas regarding this, and as always, him and his department are willing to do whatever they can to help support the scouts in Uxbridge. He told me today he just required a few days' notice and will supply the police effort we need to keep our scouts safe. And uh, just to let you know, we've done this in the past with the full support of the police department and the Board of Selectmen. So. Can you read the uh, specifics again? It's 19th starting at 2 p.m.? Yes. All right. We're going to gather and what... at the Common and parade from the Common on one side of the street to OLV. Uh, we can't you know, typically you know, take a vote or take action on anything that just comes to us at, at Citizens Forum, but um, it, it, if we need to take any action, we could do so before the 19th. I don't think we, we need to take specific action, though. It's not, is it something, we, I don't remember voting on yeah. something, unless right. you require streets being closed or something. No, nope, he gives us a police escort. We didn't yeah. do it last year, we did the year before, but we came before the board to ask permission, just, um, I guess, to cover all our ends. Okay. You know, we, uh, Chief Freitas says it's not a problem. He supports us and just looking for support from you. We don't need any permits or anything like that. <coughs> just uh, to inform you that this is something okay. that we would like to do. Yeah. It's also a great way to publicize it, too, right? It certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Good luck. Great, thanks. Thank you. Howard? Good evening. Howard Fortner, 44 North Main Street. Uh, at your meeting on the 25th of August, I asked four questions and then later asked a fifth question. Um, I followed up the next day with text of the four questions that I asked. Uh, on, uh, at your meeting on the uh, 8th of September, 
Uh, I told you at Citizens Forum that I was disappointed that my questions had not been answered. Uh, the chair responded with uh, the Board of Selectmen was going to take a big uh, look at the big picture of um, uh, the cable uh, television issue and my questions would be answered when, uh, when they address that. Uh, the next morning I sent an email to the Board of Selectmen asking when that might be. I have not yet received an answer as to when the Board of Selectmen might uh, review the big picture of the cable television issues. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I had asked a question on the 25th, would the charge to the Cable Advisory Committee be put on the town website, and the answer was yes. Uh, I asked that same question again on the 8th of uh, September uh, with essentially no response. One of my four questions was in fact answered on the 8th of September as to the number of uh, cable subscribers in the town. Um, so to the Uxbridge Board of Selectmen from Howard Fortner, at your meeting 825, I asked if the charge to the Cable Advisory Committee would be put on the town website. The answer was yes. I asked again at your meeting on 98 and followed up with an email on 99. As of noon today, September the 22nd, uh, there is no charge to the Cable Advisory Committee on the website. If I have missed it, please tell me where I might find it. Um, with that as background, please consider this a formal uh, Freedom of Information a uh, Act request for a copy of the, in quotation marks, approved charge of the Board of Selectmen referred to in the Cable Advisory Committee's agenda for their September 3 uh, meeting. Thanks for your help. Howard Fortner. Uh, just, just so you know, uh, in our packets and on the agenda tonight is acceptance of meeting minutes. Uh, in the meeting minutes of August 25th, 2008, uh, the uh, charge to the Cable Advisory Committee is noted in there. And uh, assuming that the minutes are accepted this evening, they are, as is customary, will be posted to the web. So that should uh, satisfy uh, the Freedom of Information Act request. Okay. Is anybody else interested in speaking at Citizens Forum? I'd just like to make a notation that the, the so-called charge was their own because they, they made their own charge to us and we said okay. And if you read it carefully, it uh, leaves something to be desired. But, but it was accepted? Yes, it was. Okay. Right. We've got uh, two sets of meeting minutes uh, to accept. Uh, from August 18th and August 25th. I have a motion uh, relative to the meeting minutes of August 18th. Move we accept the uh, meeting minutes of August 18th. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Second set of meeting minutes uh, in our packets uh, for August uh, 25th, 2008. Uh, any corrections noted? Just, just a, a comment, and I, I think I've mentioned this before. It, it's very important that we get the minute drafts very quickly after the meeting, because if you look at it a month later, your memory has faded, faded and it's hard to remember some of the things that went on. And you look at the August 25th one, um, you know, it's several pages long. Uh, so we're going from sketchy memory. Also, again, I want to reiterate my request that we reduce the minutes to really a, the subject matter and discussion. A discussion ensued and any action taken. Because when you try to paraphrase what people say, which is what is done in these three or four pages, it really serves no purpose, useful purpose, and it can cause problems. Do 
we'll have a motion relative to the August 25th Motion made. To accept? accept the meetings. Second. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 We've got um, two hearings scheduled for 7.15. It's not quite 7.15 yet, so do we want to jump ahead to um, item C? Update from the Chamber of Commerce? Sure. See him in the audience. Oh, yeah. oh there's there Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Did you say good morning? I did. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a nutty 24 hours. I, I have to say I, I'm celebrating the birth of my first grandchild. It just happened about seven hours. And so it's, it's all kind of blurred today. Thank you. And sometimes we're here past midnight and then it becomes morning again. Yeah, so. it does. It does. So uh, excuse me for that. Anyway, um, for anyone that hasn't met me before, I'm Joe DeLiso. I chair the Economic Development C Committee of the Blackstone Valley Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here tonight on, uh, for two purposes. One is to give you a brief update on the status of the, uh, the Valley Infrastructure Mapping Project, which I spoke to you about uh, some months ago. Uh, I'm happy to report that the work from the CMRPC uh, is generally uh, completed in terms of the first phase. As a reminder, the first phase uh, was where they would take the existing infrastructure uh, in the, from the maps, from your plans, from the different things, the 11 towns of the Valley, put them together, and then take your target development areas and overlay those uh, so that we would know. Meet with the DPD, uh, DPW and planners to see if the maps are accurate, go through that. We held a, hosted a meeting with that. Uh, many folks attended that. Uh, and so uh, the phase one, it looks like it's pretty well complete. Uh, the next phase of that is your planning and DPW folks are going to receive an invitation for a meeting on October 29th of which they uh, will get to come and see the results of the mapping and take one last look at it, make sure everything looks good, and then we'll start to roll out discussions on the phase two. Uh, the second part, also on October 29th, I'll move to my number two spot, is you will be receiving an invitation, if you haven't already, as a board of selectmen to attend the 11 town meeting for boards of, uh, board of selectmen. Um, you will be receiving an invitation in the mail, Jill. I think it's going to come directly to you and then the pass around. This is a follow-up to the 11 Town Board of Selectmen meeting we've been having, <coughs> trying to have, you know, about twice a year, which uh, Chamber will be hosting, uh, location, and et cetera, to come. But it's, if you could save the date, October 29th, uh, and for the board, it'll be 7, I think it's 7 p.m., I think is when it starts. Uh, you'll have a brief, you, at that meeting, you'll receive a brief synopsis update as to what your planners and uh, DPW folks received earlier in the day. That phase, that will be earlier in the day. Uh, we do it that way also in case anybody from any of the selectmen were interested in more detail. Sometimes you get that. They're welcome to join. Um, so you get a synopsis of it. There will be other issues which are facing all of the boards, which some of you have discussed at the last meetings. And also we intend to uh, talk in more detail about the initiative uh, that I want to speak to you briefly tonight, sort of a plan to see. And what that initiative has to do with is regionalism of the economic development, and I alluded to it to my last meeting. The Committee to Advance Economic uh, Advancement in the Valley through the Chamber of Commerce has been meeting now for over a year, and we've been developing strategies and what might be a good way, ways to improve, again, the revenue side of the Valley's budget. Uh, and when I say the valley, I mean the 11 towns. All 11 towns face, in some degree, similar challenges, some more than others. Um, we certainly understand what's uh, your budget, so we've become somewhat involved in that, in terms of at least trying to understand it. But they're all challenged to some degree because, very simply, when you look at our economy, um, we are in the valley are living in between economies. 
you know, the economy that built all of our infrastructures, the town halls, the infrastructure we have and all that was, uh, came at a time when the mills were still running. We are in between economies and we're looking forward to that future. One thing that struck me was as I was president of the chamber uh, for about a year and a half, uh, not too long ago, is that there is no place that anyone can, from outside the area can come to, into the valley, to tell them where certain opportunities exist for development. There are pockets, but uh, as president of the chamber, we used to get inquiries from people from, from the Commonwealth, from Boston, from outside. Hey, I've got an I've got a office plan I want to build or a manufacturing plan or a distribution center. I need about five acres, 10 acres. I want to put up 50,000, 100,000, employ 100 people. There's no place, good place, where you can react to that quickly. And I was facing that as, as chamber president many times. It just doesn't exist here. What does happen, I want to share with you today, is what is happening around the Commonwealth to deal with that. And this first piece, Michael, you came in just beautifully. Thank you. This is a map of the, thank you very much, Mike. This is a map of the Commonwealth. And what you see on this map in the colored areas are the existing economic development councils that exist around the Commonwealth. And you're, you, some of you may be familiar with some of them. Um, certainly the yellow on it is the Berkshire Economic, the green is the Western Mass, the red is the North Central, the purple, if you could see right there, is um, the 490, they call that the 495 Metro West Corridor. Up in the light blue is the Merrimack Valley Economic Development Council, the South Purple is the South Coast, of course the Cape. What you might find difficult to see from that distance is the yellow, which is both Boston and Worcester metropolitan areas, they each have their own economic development councils because obviously they have the population and budgets to support. Interesting thing about these councils, number one is they generally are staffs, they have a, generally an executive director staffs, typically three, four, five people. The largest happens to be Western Mass, which have, we understand is 16, but they also do a lot, that group does a lot of financing land management and has a much broader scale. Of all of them, the most recently successful happens to be the Merrimack Valley uh, because they, of course, had the Devons exposure and were instrumental in that. But they are a very fast growing, very highly dynamic, and very visible uh, council in Boston. Another dynamic that you'll notice as you study these is that they tend to follow uh, transportation corridors. Uh, the Western Mass, for example, follows is, is primi primarily around 91. Berkshire tends to see its activity around Route 7. The North Central is paid, primarily hovers around the Route 2 area, but naturally you'll see that. The other areas, there is a new one that's coming up. It's called the North Shore, and it has not formally released yet, so we're expecting to see that map populate relatively soon. Um, what these groups do, as you probably know, is they advance economic development discussions. Um, they typically host websites. They, they try to gather uh, developers, landowners, towns, and such to bring these people together so that they can have much more marketable skills. They advocate in, the, in Boston for grants, for infrastructure, all the such. Um, what our committee is committed to try to do is try to see such an organization feel, fund come out of the Blackstone Valley. Uh, we think that we're positioned for growth. We think that the time is right, the 146 ex, you know, interchange to the Mass Pike, the timing is good. We are limited, as you know, by infrastructure. We need stronger voice in the Commonwealth, not as a single town, but as an organized group. We represent 100,000 people, just these 11 towns. As an organized group, we do have some visibility, but only as a region. Uh, we, on the 29th, we want to talk about this more, but we, are, we, we, want to, we will be inviting, in essence, your town, the town of Oxford, certainly to join such an effort. Um, you might ask w and why and what it would look like if you could just put up the second one. And again, this is planting a seed, so when we discuss it further on the 29th. We're just a group of volunteers, much like you are, working on a regional level, trying to come up with ways to increase the economies by in a positive manner. Um, the concept is, is basically, it's not rocket science, and these organizations are, are structured many different ways. By the way, one other unique thing about all the economic development councils is they've all been structured pretty much since the 1990s. This is a relatively new phenomenon. It's a new wave. 
and it's a new way to do it uh, in Massachusetts. Not unusual in the South, but definitely unusual up here. Our concept that we're advancing, we'll be advancing, is simply an organization that consists of the 11 towns, each with a representative, a member that sits on the council. Um, we will then look to the business community to also come up with 11 members that represent certain businesses and also willingness to support it, and then members of the Commonwealth. For example, on our committee today, we have the Mass Office of Business Development. We're working with the Small Business Technical Association in the, in the marketing departments. And, and uh, so we expect a couple members of the Commonwealth. In discussing this with our state representatives and our senator, uh, in this case, Senator Moore, um, one prevailing message comes loud and clear from our representatives, and that is that they believe they can bring the Commonwealth to the game to participate as they do in the other, as the other councils often get grant money to some help support, but only if the towns commit and have show some level of commitment themselves, because the, the buzzword in, in Boston is sustainability, as you all know. They need something to sustain. So we look at this to have a council, and then from that, obviously have probably a steering committee, a chair to be elected by the group, then uh, to have an executive director and initially maybe one staff member. The Chamber of Commerce is very interested in facilitating, will be offering, and in, in, in is anticipating providing office space, shared computers, shared telephones, and all the things that you know help reduce the cost of launching this. Um, one other question that certainly will come to mind is, and that is, okay, well, that's neat, and we certainly makes a whole lot of sense. Who's going to fund it? How's it going to be paid for? And who's going to do this? Um, we, have, we're gonna, we have a thought process on that, too. And that is, we've, we're going to create a basic operating budget um, to go into it. Now, however, I want you to come out of the game knowing that we look at it as investment. And one of the key measurables for this group that we would hold it to would be that it generate much more revenue in a multiple of its cost. To, to the towns in direct, either in improved tax uh, income and or grant uh, monies coming in that wouldn't have been otherwise. So we certainly look at this, once it gets into momentum, as should be a no cost, but a rather a revenue producing entity. Uh, that is critical to our belief and critical to the mission. Uh, we think if it doesn't generate positive revenue, it shouldn't be done, okay? But obviously you gotta get started. The second issue is how to do it. If all 11 towns uh, were, were to gather, we're, we're proposing that each town make a commitment of $1 per resident uh, to initially to fund. Um, for it, it's, we've come up with a lot of different ways to do it. It happens to be our suggestion. It's easy to get your hand around. It talks to the issue of uh, fairness to the big town, small town, what have you, which towns might benefit other, and it's a very simple way to do it. With our, you will see a, a, a preliminary agreement concept, and that concept is very simple. If we can get, seven, if the, we as a group can receive seven towns to make a commitment in, at least in spirit, to this plan, uh, it, we will then take the task of going to the business community and to the Commonwealth to raise matching funds uh, to pool with that, which would cover, we think, the expenses to do that. Um, and we would expect this group to be positively generating revenues in two years, and, but our plan is to have a three-year kick. That's basically the concept. Um, we can talk more about it if you could come with questions. And um, I will finish by saying there's a group of people out there, members of the chamber, members of the community, all live in the valley, that are willing to work this. Uh, they're volunteers trying to make it happen. I hope that you see the light in it, and we look forward to your support. Any questions? Yeah, one quick one, actually. If, we, if you can hold up the first uh, chart again. Sure. Uh, the, the big white area in, in the center, which is you know, essentially the, the greater Worcester County area. Yeah. Or the southern Worcester County area. This um, area right here? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, the, the 11 town group would be more of the southeast corner of that, right, right. So do you see two regional organizations in that open white space right now? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to try to, you know, encompass, you know, all the towns that are in there? Because if you look at, you know, the size of the other organizations, you know, as far as geographically, they're a lot bigger than yeah. our 11 town group. Yeah, Kevin, that's a fabulous question. And um, I have, our, the answer, 
that we have at this moment is this. Um, getting towns to get together and, and collaborate takes, is a process unto itself. Uh, of all of the situation, of all the towns right now uh, around, the valley has a, has a positive energy for collaboration. Um, I certainly think, now I'll, I'll speak as an individual mm -hmm. on this case, I certainly see that the towns of Webster, Douglas, I mean not Douglas, but Webster and Oxford and Auburn and, and some others, uh, may definitely uh, make sense to join in on, on this. Auburn maybe ties better with Worcester, if you look at it geographically. Um, I'm not, Sturbridge has its own concept and is actually working on such a thing on its own at, as we speak. Um, there, the two major thoroughfares are 146 and 395, and I think clearly those two, as they start to converge and you look at it as you just did, at 20,000 feet, right. it says yes. Um, we're, t we're 15 people at the moment. We're looking to get something off the ground. We believe that the valley, the Blackstone Valley, is the place to begin, and certainly believe that as that gets momentum, uh, the logic of this prevail, and some of those other towns, I think, uh, certainly make sense to it. And I think what will happen is, is you'll get the, the 395 corridor, logically, to come together. And I do believe one office uh, could logically do that. On the other hand, I wouldn't want to start, and this is the other discussion we had, extensive, we wouldn't want to try to start to get 20 communities to make a commu commitment because I don't, you know, I already got enough gray hair, it would be too long. We want to get something going um, before we could accomplish that, and success breeds success. Okay. So th that, that's our, our answer, and we would see, we do hope for it to expand, right. absolutely. Yeah. Plus, we'd like the focus to start right here. Sure. Any other yeah. questions? When would you be looking for a commitment from this town? Thank you for the question, Kerry. Our, our goal uh, for this would be to get, um, our mission is to get a commitment, if you will, and uh, agree uh, that it is in essence somewhat of a supportive and moral commitment going in, because we understand budget processes and all of that. Our mission is to accomplish this by Thanksgiving. Okay, that's our goal, to get the town commitments in by Thanksgiving. I will be sending to you, Dill, I suppose I'd send to you if you just, uh, I guess I would be the appropriate person, a copy of the basic cons conceptual outline and, and structure, um, and then we can discuss on the 29th, and our hope is for Thanksgiving to get that kind of a commitment. With those commitments, we are willing as a group to come and speak at any town meeting, any finance committee, any budget process, anything you might, that we might lend a hand to uh, to help you get support, you know, if the board finds support uh, for it. And our, in terms of funding, our look is to get into the 2010 budget cycle. And if we can have these commitments by Thanksgiving, that gives us an opportunity to get to the Commonwealth into their budget cycle as well for 2010. Okay. But, just so you know, relative to allocating funding, you know, by Thanksgiving, we've missed the deadline to put an article on the warrant if the, if, you know, I'm not even sure if the board's supportive yet or not, but yeah. um, our warrant is closed actually for, for the fall town meeting. So we, we would be looking at, you know, spring would be the earliest, unless there's a special time meeting in between. Okay. okay, well, we're looking to get into, as far as funding is concerned, our, our targeting on that is, is the 210, which is July okay. of, of uh, 09. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's where okay. we're working towards. All right, that's fine. Question, sure, comment. Um, in, in the, my experience with business people looking to start a new business or relocate or expand someplace, they generally have studied the market. They have an idea of where they want to locate based on what their requirements are. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't recall any instance in that process where we went to something like this. One of the reasons we wouldn't because of competitive reasons. You know, most business expansions or new ones are in a competitive type environment. They don't necessarily want to tip their hand as to where they're going to open a new uh, facility. And I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that I could get from that that I couldn't get on my own as far as information. Um, Where am I wrong? Well, I don't know if you're wrong, but it may just be your experience. 
um, let me address this this way. I'll give you a personal example. For a number of years, what I did for a career is, pla is place manufacturing sites throughout the United States. The process for, for corporation, the process was simple. Uh, we would decide where we, that a new facility would be needed and in what general market. And that general market usually was a region, New England, Southeast, South Florida, South uh, Mid-Atlantic, uh, Texas, California, okay, that. So that takes you there. Once the business case has been developed for that, that generally t could take six months to two years. But once the business case was developed that, yes, we want to place something in that region, the first, the second step would be then to find out what the target areas would be in that that might be able to facilitate, would have the right kind of labor force, et cetera. That was always done on a regional basis. Generally, we'd put a dot somewhere about where we wanted geographically and would draw a 100 square mile circle. And then people would research populations, general populations and such to get a fair idea. Once we were at that, then we knew that that area could sustain it from basic demographic information. The next step that follows is we would contact the state where we would target and generally contact two or three states if they were joining because if you, we always wanted to have more than one state in the game. You contact the state and say, we're interested in placing a site. Where would you recommend and where could we go? Always we would make contact, short of up in here in New England, but everywhere else in the country, you'd get contact with a state agency, and of which there is one in Massachusetts, and they would then connect you to the local regional economic development office in their area. Some areas they're state run, some of them they're chamber of commerce run. Um, we would arrive, I would get off a plane, and I, they, I would be met by a member of the Commonwealth and the regional economic development, I would go to their office, they would typically show me five or six sites that would look and fit the profile that we sent them. They would entertain me for two days, I'd physically see it, they'd lay out an outline, and, I would, and then I would leave with all the information. I would then receive continuous calls, follow-ups, and letters from these regional economic development offices to see how we're doing, what can they do to help, what could we answer, whatever. Uh, they put me up, they do this, they would do that all to make sure that we were, that they were competing against whatever region, alternatively, other state we're looking at. Once we made the decision as to the area, we would go and I would generally meet with a member from the, the state, in our case, the Commonwealth, and or a regional director of some sort, executive director, and the deal would be cut in terms of an outline. Never formalized, because it would always have to go for approval from the town, but that was generally a stamp and a deal would be cut on different things. Um, such a deal would be go, I never, would never generally have to go. They always handled it for me. I never met with a town, I never met with a planner, I never met with anyone like that. It was always through that office. Uh, that's how far it can go. Um, and how long does that process take? Um, I will, from the time that I would decide that that's the location to the time I'd have bulldozers, gen I would expect 90 days. 90 days from the time I said, that's where we'll go, we'll sign the deal, and I'd have bulldozers moving ground. That's what it's like in other areas of the country. I can assure you, sir, it's that's like not that, what it's yeah. like here. Well, I, I, I can assure you <laughs> not that. Not by a long shot. Well, you know, I can assure you of that as well. And I've lived in Massachusetts, for, and I live in the Valley, and I've lived here for 15 years. I can also tell you that the Commonwealth is working hard to try to change the impression of Massachusetts outside the business, in the business community outside of Massachusetts because we are known as a very difficult state to do business with. We are known to be incredibly di uh, difficult in terms of launching anything. And, the, and, I, and I submit it to you because businesses that can put significant employment jobs together go through an extensive process prior to ever it, it coming to a community to your point. These are confidential discussions. And once they're ready to make it public and go out, they're ready to go. And if they're looking at it, a region that's in Rhode Island or in New York or you know, some area where they can move in three months as opposed to working, you know, taking a year, um, the, the, the decision is it's, it's not even a question. And it's why you see, and it's, and it's personally why, example, Valley is lacking in infrastructure and hasn't you know, done certain things. Um, there are exceptions, and a great exception is what's hap happened up at Devons, where they organized it out, they laid it out, they pre-planned it, 
And then all of a sudden, kaboom, everybody started coming because it's now ready. The Commonwealth, you're familiar with the 40B3 program. The 40B3 program is simply nothing than an attempt at the Commonwealth to convince the towns to try to do some pre-planning, permitting, and they'll, in essence, they were granting up, in, up until recently 150, now it's $100,000 to a town for studies and such if they make one commitment. And you're familiar with the commitment, yes. I'm sure. That one commitment is we'll do it within, I think it's 180 days, I, I, my mind's going, okay? All, that, all they're trying to do is to change that dynamic so that the Commonwealth can be vibrant. Um, you have to appreciate one other thing. I'm a resident of Blackstone Valley by choice. All of the members of our committee are Blackstone Valley residents. We love the valley for what it is. We don't want it to turn into Framingham. We have no desire for that. But we do know that um, some condensed development that has high value and jobs, good quality jobs in the valley, will do more to improve um, our town budgets than a broad spectrum of small things. Because if you don't plan for the good ones, you get the ones that other people don't want. Or you just get your local, uh, you know, just you know, small developments, which people make on their own, okay? In town, you don't have to convince anybody in town, but for significant impacts to the revenue base with small amounts of land, high density, and I say that in a positive way, um, it requires this kind of work. Um, and that's the difference, I think. And I hope I've answered at least giving you another viewpoint. Thank you. I got a question. Oxbridge is kind of looked in a negative way as far as, as, far as business goes. Everybody thinks uh, Oxbridge, Oxbridge has a bad reputation of not wanting any biz, business here. What could you do for us to change that? Well, I, 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 would, I would submit that the first thing that we would do is we would support this kind of initiative because there's nothing wrong with Uxbridge. It's a great town. It's a great, it's a neat place to live. Um, all in the Valley is. What we need are advocates. If you were running a business, um, what business would you choose to run and, not, and decide, well, I'll do, I will, I will get my maintenance department um, in my engineering departments, but I don't need a sales or marketing group. You know, I don't need anybody in sales and marketing. Okay, I don't need anybody selling. But the fact is, is that, that we as uh, leaders, you as selectmen, we have our two basic resources. We have land and citizenry. Those are the resources of a town. Um, our mission, I think, as leaders and as selectmen, are what can we do to positively impact uh, and bring uh, improvements in the lives of our citizenry, and at the same time, preserve and protect the land for its best possible use. That means we want to be sure once a land is grabbed, once a land piece of land is used for a source, it's gone. It, that determines it. It's, it's that for a long time. So we want to be careful. We, want, uh, we advocate development by choice as opposed to development by chance. Whose choice? If you follow this, counts, this concept, you have 11 towns, each town having their own representative on it. So, for example, the mapping project that we just did, you, the, each town was asked to identify areas that they had for target development and to identify what types of development they preferred to see on those, okay? So th that was to give some people indications. Um, now, ultimately, if you don't have the landowner in, in, involved in the process, you don't have a whole lot of uh, to do. Um, but I think landowners have a, have a say, potential developers have a say. And you know, what land do you want to preserve? What land do you want to develop? The fact is, if we don't get involved in a discussion point, if we don't have a vehicle for this, then who, you're right, who, what will, who will decide? But at least have an opportunity to voice one opinion, to put some plan together, to try to have a vehicle or people to bring the landowners together, and at least you got a, ch a shot at it, you know? There's no, there's no guarantee on anything, but without discussion, without attempt, there's no result. And I think, Bruce, to your point, uh, the way to best handle it is if you have an advocate, someone that is out there beating the drum, talking about the positive sides of the valley, when somebody calls, say, I've got, yeah, we have opportunity, we'll match you up with this, you know, we got an opportunity, let's work it. And they have somebody calling positively, a, a, in, just think in right, terms of right. a sales and marketing group, somebody positively creating energy, that dynamic changes and your reputation changes. Um, 
It's when you make a call and you look, somebody wants to call and say, I'd like to learn, and they go, well, I can't help you. And you believe me, experts could use the uh, money. Well, we certainly, all of our towns could. I mean, I live in Sutton, our town could use, uh, certainly use uh, budgetary improvement, and we can't do it on the backs of, uh, on, on homes. Residential tax rates, you know, no. we're not looking to double those, so we do need to find ways. The other is, I'd like my, for example, I'd love my children to be able to live in the area, but I have to encourage them to leave because for career opportunities, they're better to go. Why do we, why do, we do that? Why aren't we focusing on bringing higher paid jobs into the valley, uh, you know, into the area? And that's what regional development is about. Again, in a good balance to preserve, we've got great history, we've got great views, we've got lakes, recreation, we've got to do all that too. I, you know, don't misread, economic's not a bad word. Uh, but that's the kind of thing. But we do need an entity creating positive energy in this area. We need an entity in Boston, some people developing relationships, hammering the fact we need infrastructure. Where, when are we getting our sewer and water budgets into, you know, into the state and federal coffers? Budgets, we need that type of, somebody representing us, not, no dispersions on our state reps and senators, they all do a good job, but I mean specifically in this, in this area. I hope I answered your question. I, I guess to, to follow up on that, um, part of the reason we're losing business, and part of the reason we're not attracting business is the fact that the state has got a adversarial tax and regulatory approach to business. What are you doing to lobby Beacon Hill to change that? Well, I can speak on the on the behalf of the chamber on that particular case, and uh, as you would expect, Michael, the chamber um, is has a number of initiatives in terms of positions on tax. The most uh, uh, I think strong, our strongest position and most uh, steadfast position is that we prefer to see the avoidance of a dual tax rate. Uh, the chamber does not support a dual tax rate. Uh, evidence continues to show that once you, you move down that slippery slope, it is a slippery slope and it's a clear signal to anyone that is either uh, moving into business in an area or one that's there that this is not the right environment because it's set the tone. So we, uh, gratefully, most of the valley is on a, is on a one tax rate. So, so there's one position. Uh, I think you're starting to see some activity in the, in the, in the, at Beacon Hill right now trying to deal with the issue of, of tax rates and such. I mean, Worcester is a perfect example of a business tax, dual business tax rate that's gone amok. I mean, that's a perfect example in shining armor uh, of what might happen. The other, and I just want to make Reese other point, Mike, you made a great one, and that's I've sort of been talking about new businesses coming in. Just as importantly, we have businesses here that need helping hands, uh, someone to help support them, someone that they can talk to about expansion and, and how to maneuver through the various regulatory issues and such. But the, the, the message that's being sent, though, is, is quite different. I mean, they're, they're constantly hopping on how we've got to close all of these evil loopholes in our tax system. Well. One politician's evil loophole is a businessman's reasonable business deduction. So it's, you know, when, when you constantly trumpet from Beacon Hill that we want to cut down on the reasonable business deductions by closing loopholes, you're not sending a positive message. Beacon Hill is not sending a positive message. They're not supporting what you're trying to do. Um, actually, I'd like to just, yeah. I, we actually do need to move on. I, yeah, I, I that's fine. on the agenda, but. Um, okay. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Listen, thank you very much for a uh, great discussion. Thank you for your time. Please come to October 29th. We can get in this, this discussion over a cup of coffee sometime if you'd like. Oh, yeah, anytime. Yeah. Uh, you know how to get a hold of me. I'll send the information, my contact information out, and you can call me anytime. October 29th, we can discuss this with all 11 selectmen boards together. Yeah. Okay? Very good. Super. Thank so you. Nice good to me. <laughs> All right. Then we have a public hearing to consider an application for a beer and wine license for Nico's Pizza and Chicken. So I will uh, open the public hearing and uh, read the notice. Lexbridge Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing to consider an application for a retail alcoholic beverage license for Samir Shanuda, applicant from Nico's Pizza and Chicken. 
294 North Main Street, Uxbridge, Mass, 01538. Uh, you're here. So. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Samir Shinoda. I own uh, and I run Nico's Pizza with, my, with the help of my family. And I would like to apply for the beer and wine license to improve my uh, business in this economy. And I wonder if I get you all uh, drunk, I mean approved and, uh, <laughs> on the license. Has, uh, we look, look through everything, and, okay. I'm gonna pass the Public Safety Committee and. Uh, Doesn't go before the Public Safety Committee. Oh, I'm sorry, but. We contact, yeah. Um, just one thing to note is the applicant is requesting that the license would be effective January 1st of 2009 mm -hmm. and for the ABCC they have no issue with that it'll just be stated on a <coughs> that's turned in okay all right is uh, there anybody anyone from the public like to speak on behalf uh, or, or against uh, th this uh, request I'll close the public commentary. Uh, questions from the board? We, uh, we only have 12 alcoholic uh, licenses. Is that true? No, under beer and wine, there's only two available, correct? Well, that's what I meant. We had 12 all together and 10 are taken right now. We have, we have no, 27 licenses total. Oh, okay. Of varying types. That's what I mean. Well, that's outside 105. The two left. Did, did, just so I understand the, the summary table that, that mm -hmm. you put together here, section 12, all alcohol, um, there are two available. Section 12, beer and wine, there are two available. Uh, Samir's requesting one of those too, right? Two beer and wine. Correct. Okay, which would still leave one available. Mm -hmm. Then are they renewable? Is it annually? They're renewable annually. And the existing license holder, it, it's generally, it's an automatic renewal. There is, there's paperwork and there's a process, but you don't have to go through the public hearing process. And your licenses increase based on your population. I think 15,000 is the next, um, pop the, the level at which we would be granted additional licenses. Okay. And if does the license transfer with the business or is each? There's a process. Any type of change of license, change of manager, change of sale of a business requires per ABCC regulations that paperwork be submitted. But there is an expectation of transfer. You'd have to have a reason not to transfer it with a change of, change of owner. Um, who are our five allowed beer and wine right now? I don't know that off the top of my head. Well, it's five or allowed three. I'm sorry, are, three who are, are three? Issued. three right. I'm sorry, right. Three, who are three the three? Are issued. There's one right near Nico's that's issued. Inspirations has one, doesn't it? Yes. Have one? Yeah, Inspiration has one, I think. Now, do you already have a capacity of 48 seats? Yes. So there's not going to be any add none no or anything like that? Of anyone's head, you know, anyone know where the other beer and wine is? Papa Gino's has a license. Okay, that would right, be the other yeah. one then. Okay. And there's still there's one more. That one well, more that would be available, right? No, no I mean th th there are three already in effect. About the green one. Right. Um, no, that's an all. Uh, it's all that. Green 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 all. Papa Gino's inspirations and is it Christina's? Is that? No, Oxford Shell. One of the gas stations. They, oh, oh. they can serve? No, no section. So, um, I'm sorry, you're right. Oh, they're the second, third section, that'd section 15. 15. That'd be different. Yeah, okay. I can print you the list, and that shows the. There's no there, section 15, anyway. You ready for a motion? Yeah. yeah. Motion, we grant the um, uh, beer and wine license to. Who is it? Semi well, Shinoda. Is it, it's in the business entity name, though, not. Okay. Not personal. Yes. Right? To. It, you're actually incorporated, Nico. aren't you? Correct. Is it, is it Emmanuel? It's Nico's Pizza or? and Chicken. No, it's no. Uh, Bridge Technical Services. Yeah, there's a corporation name. British 
Technical so, services? Services, yeah, correct. License to be effective January 1st. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, I just, so therefore, the hearing is not actually for him at Negro Keith. The hearing would be for the corporation. Well, this identifies the location, though, and, and, and the, the DBA. Right. I'm referring to the legal notice just on the, so what should the legal? No. That's, no? It's is that fishing. fine? It right. doesn't have to list the corporation? Yes, All right. motion and second. Okay. Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second public hearing to consider an application for a change of alcoholic beverage license type from the Polish American Social and Civic Corporation. Okay. Right. Open the hearing. Mr. Porter Slepp can hold a public hearing to consider an application for the change of alcoholic beverage license type for Steve Mason, applicant manager, Polish American Social and Civic Corporation, 217 Menden Street, uh, Uxbridge, Mass, 01569. Um, I, I do just want to point out that. On the agenda for this evening, uh, the, the there's a typo in the business address that says 217 Main Street, uh, that should be Menden Street. However, the, the, the legal notice and all the paperwork is, was processed with the correct address, so it was just a typo only on the agenda for this evening. Okay. Okay, okay. it's all yours. Yeah, basically um, what we need to do is uh, bring in more business. We want to put some, uh, some signs up, basically open to the public, um, because as everybody knows, business and around the area is pretty slow and we need to generate more money so that's the idea behind the change of the license club itself will not change we'll still be shareholders and board directors I understand there's an issue of tax payments that they've been made coming um, from what I understand and, and Mike Kowalczyk has that yeah. information um, that we're one behind okay uh, we have a bylaw that was passed a few years ago. Uh, they tried to pass it several times. It was defeated. Finally, it was passed. And uh, the board is not authorized to issue any license, certain licenses, to people or, or corporations or businesses where their real estate taxes aren't current. Um, so I, I'll approve the license. I'll vote to approve the license. but subject to paying the taxes. It's really unfortunate that we do that because if you think about it, it we deny a person, let's assume it's an individual wanting to sell hot dogs to feed his family. We don't allow them to sell hot dogs to feed their family until they pay their real estate taxes. But someone can work for the town of Uxbridge and not pay their real estate taxes. They can still go to work and get a check. So it, it's a bylaw, it's an awful bylaw, it should not have been passed, it should be repealed, but until it is, that's what the law is. Okay. I have a question about the, the license, actually. Uh, the, the, the note that uh, we received from Kim indicates that um, this is already counted in the uh, 12 that are, that are yeah. issued. Mm -hmm. And so just the, the <clears throat> conversion from a club to a, a general on-premise does not change anything there other than their ability to advertise and, and open up to the public. And if not approved, my understanding is they may continue to operate under the existing license type. Right. Okay. okay. Are we limited to so many under those license types? No, however, there's, you have to demonstrate, there's certain things you have to demonstrate to obtain a club license. Um, and that's what I've actually talked with the applicants about. I had some advice from council at AVCC on additional materials AVCC will be reviewing. Basically, if you, your articles of organization allow you to operate as a club, it in a way precludes you from operating under the way in which they'd be looking for you to operate to obtain a general or premise license. 
So us granting the, the change of license status uh, may or may not ultimately be approved by the ABCC. Correct. That correct? That's the advice of counsel. I, I, I called to clarify because the blue book, some of the ABCC regulations, um, as he put it, oversimplify the process. But if you read the entire chapter 138 and look at the other regulations, it is more involved. Okay, so if the ABCC does not then approve it mm -hmm. after we approve it, is there a procedure that we will then have to follow? It just, you just, you don't. Just go under the same license. Right. You just don't get Existing the new license, license type yeah. issued. Until he makes the whatever requirements the state imposes. Now, I got a question for you. Will that allow you to serve el uh, alcohol and beer upstairs too? Well, we do that now. We oh, you do that now? Oh, have, okay. Yeah. I don't go down In the function hall. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you served alcohol up yep. upstairs. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board uh, on this request? Sir? Come up to the microphone, please. Here. Yes, up to the microphone. <clears throat> now, I do have some questions and some comments. Uh, Can you which, identify yourself first? Oh, Romuel Drazwitz, 5 Morrison Street, Oxbridge. Uh, <clears throat> I've been a f financial secretary for about 14 years at the Polish American Social and Civic Corporation until December 31, 2005. And I do have some comments, and I would like to pose some questions. And I hope that some of these comments or questions will uh, persuade the board not to approve this change of type in a liquor license. Uh, now, <clears throat> we do have a situation where the shareholders were not notified of this particular request. There were two meetings. The board of directors, by laws, say they have to report the doings the doings of the directors at each quarterly meeting. This was not done. This was not brought up. Just by accident, I happened to, I uh, was brought to my attention, it was in a paper in that fine print in the Telegram and Gazette. And then I came down here, of course, got uh, the details. So <clears throat> this is the, the first uh, reason. Now, <clears throat> we have a situation where not only the shareholders were not notified, we have not had any treasurer's reports. We haven't had any uh, other financial reports, any audits, even though it's been put down on our tax forms that we had an audit of a financial statement, which was never done. So n for three years, none of this has been reported. There are problems with the finances. So then we have a situation on August 25th, 2008, I received a call from the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Now, my name is still listed at the Department of Revenue along with the secretary. I informed them that I was no longer the person responsible for paying those taxes, which I had been doing for 14 years. Now, the problem was they informed me they had been trying to contact the organization. At least four letters were sent out, numerous phone calls were made to bring it to our attention that there is a serious non-payment of taxes. Now, I just heard about this business of, well, we'll just let it go, you don't pay the taxes. No, there should be a reason why those taxes aren't being paid. Now, at that time, I discussed with the Department of Revenue I was having the same problem with disclosure, public disclosure, of the internal revenue situation, the 990 tax form, which was not being done. The new financial secretary, whose name is here, Michael Kowalczyk, has refused to provide any 990s, three years. And in addition, just like the Department of Revenue, requests were not on it. This would be the secretary, the board, the president, right down the line. So that's another reason. <clears throat> and this is all related to our liquor license 
since most of these are meals and beverage taxes, which is a large amount of money. Now, we have chapter 138, <coughs> section 12, club license. If you have fix a salary, vote a salary, you have to do it within the first two months of after January 1st. Then, within the first three months, the secretary has to send a list to the licensing authority, which is the board of selectmen, giving the names of the employees, officers, and their salaries. Now, the reason for this, as you know, is when you have a nonprofit organization, a club license, there's been an abuse of the sharing of the profits, so-called, where salaries were uh, made very large, one way of just getting the money out of the organization. So that's why they have that uh, situation. Now, what made it worse here is the way it was done. Now, we had a discrimination suit filed against us. Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination informed us that the suit has been filed by one of the employees who claimed discrimination, age discrimination, because a younger employee was being hired. She was going to take her place, and the suit was filed. Now, during the course of the investigation by the commission, the person, the complainant, was given a sum of money at which time, and this is all perfectly legal, because at that point, you are still allowed to withdraw your complaint. So the commission dismisses the complaint because the parties came to a resolution of the conflict. So a sum of money is paid. Now, this sum of money goes to an attorney, I guess, or we never know. We never get a report. And it's over $500, thousands of dollars, which uh, bylaws state have to be approved by the shareholders. It was not done. And not only that, immediately after we gradually get this from the board, the financial secretary, Michael Kowalczyk, the president now was the one that was charged with hiring the younger bartender. And what happened? After the money was paid, the financial secretary, then Michael Kowalczyk, whose name is on the request here, makes a motion to give the president a raise just after. And this, I believe, is a complete disregard of the law itself, to give the president a raise after it costs us thousands of dollars to settle the complaint. Uh, now, sir, just, I just yes. want to ask a question. Um, Obviously, you have, you're alleging you know, sloppy, so, no, can't even talk tonight. <laughs> sloppy corporate management and as far as adherence to bylaws, those types of things. Um, but what I'd ask you to, to testify to this evening, are, are there any particular reasons uh, why the change of license type should not be granted uh, at this point? So certainly, you're, you're indicating uh, maybe issues with the, the corporate bylaw adherence and, and the timeliness of reports and some other things, but that, that really is not really germane to our discussion this evening, which is um, specifically about the, the change of type of license. So is there anything specific to, to that notion? Well, it's specific in this respect that the license now is not being carried out properly. There are too many problems. The money is unaccounted for. And we have the improper, uh, well, according to the ABC, uh, these problems are being brought up with the ABC. But I was told by legal counsel, come down here. This is up to the Board of Selectmen. Tell them what the problems are, and then it's up to the board. They want to make the decision fine. And that's, that's what I'm doing now. I'm just bringing up that there are problems with the license as it is. And we're going to compound it, and you shall see in uh, just a minute. And the other thing is, I do have a question on uh, the paperwork here, but I'll just give you the answer to the last part of what can happen when you transfer or when you change the license type. 
Now, the license type now is a club license. It has certain restrictions. So if you change the type, this is what's going to happen. You're going to leave the organization open to having its tax exemption under the 501C7 revoked. That's what's going to happen. That's why we're asking you not to do this. Tax exemption will be lost. Now, how does it become uh, lost? It becomes unrelated business expense. We just heard we want to make money. We want to go to the outside and bring it in. And a prime reason for revoking a tax exemption is public. In other words, how much public are you, as I said? So if you're going to go out to make all this big money and so on, then you have to go out to the public and you can't do that and have a tax exemption. That's according to the IRS. Uh, IRS. So I think that is one reason why it shouldn't be changed is because the whole system is going to fall apart. And this is related to the state. In other words, our charter. We are not organized as a borrower. We're not chartered as a borrower. We're a social and civic organization. That's the important thing. See, we're not in the business of serving liquor. See, this is only something that is in addition to ours. We're social and civic. So uh, in that respect, I, I think that I think the board should consider some of these uh, reasons because it does reflect on you know, responsibility within the town. I've been here at these meetings before, and people come in asking for a permit, and all the time they give references. We're in this town. Ask anybody there about our business. Are we going to be a credit to your town? And that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm bringing up these points. Now, Mr. Azraith, can I ask you a question, yeah. please? How many shareholders are uh, you talking about? Pardon? How many shareholders are there in the Polish shop? Oh. Uh, I don't have the correct number of shareholders, but the last time I was trying to get uh, some information on the uh, mailing list, uh, I think it was close to a hundred, uh, uh, this is unofficial, a hundred cards to be sent out for a meeting. So. But shouldn't these sort of questions be raised by the shareholders to the board of directors? Pardon? And should not these questions be raised by the shareholders? Yes to the Board of Directors. Right. And we if have the been prohibited from uh, bringing up a uh, good many of these questions at the uh, meetings. We have been stonewalled, I'll put it bluntly. But can't the shareholders fire the Board of Directors? And the shareholders uh, uh, will not respond to a uh, good many of the problems that we have. Problems uh, we've been involved with. Uh, yeah, but un un under the bylaws, I mean, I'd, who, who Bylaws are not being followed. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know why that would be a problem for this board if the internal bylaws aren't. It, it isn't. It isn't. And as to the, relate, the, the issue of unrelated business income, an exempt organization many times will have income unrelated to its exempt activities. And to that extent, that unrelated business income is subject to unrelated business income tax, which is part of their requirements, but it has nothing to do with uh, the issuing of a license by us. The, um, uh, the other club over in North Uxbridge. Progressive, progressive, progressive Club. Progressive yeah, club. Progressive Club. They have a you know, club license, I mean a regular all-alcohol license. So I, I, I guess, yeah, there may be internal problems, but I don't know that they're germane to our deliberations here. I, I don't... Well, there were some liquor laws involved. In fact, uh, uh, with my talk, I'll just give you an example. There were some uh, questions, issues. Uh, it seems that uh, when I was financial secretary, I would bring up certain points of things that we're not supposed to do. We'll be violating the law. And yet, uh, this was not listened to. Now, I did go to the, they wanted it in black and white, that we can't do these things. We're breaking laws, the IRS code, we're breaking the laws of Massachusetts uh, state laws. I went to the ABC uh, numerous times. I would just get uh, an opinion from anybody that was there. However, one time when they wanted this in black and white, I did go to the legal counsel. And at that time, I had to put down 
who I was, my status, and so on. And I came in with the questions, the paperwork, and so on. And at that point, I was ushered into a room, and I was told, anything you say may be used against you. That, get a lawyer. In other words, before this, I was given a little lecture on, uh, well, not a lecture, uh, but some knowledge on the permitting of illegalities. And this is all related to our license now the permitting of illegalities on the premises of a licensed establishment. So apparently there are problems. Now, if I was the officer at that time, and I'm going in, I'm asking you, is this breaking the law of something that we're doing, and I'm there as an officer, that puts me on a spot, because I am permitting an illegality. I may not be committing it myself, but the fact is that I'm an officer, I should be doing something about it. But so there th are That's problems. a risk assumed by, by the board, though. I, 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 I'll invite you to speak in a minute. Um, that's a risk assumed by the board, though. And, and if they were to endorse those types of actions, there's certainly, you know, there, I, you probably have some type of insurance that covers, you know, board, quote unquote, misconduct or, or whatever the case may be. But that's, that's, a, you know, that's a risk that the board takes. But, but again, I, I guess I'm, I'm still trying to understand the, the, the relevance to the, this board's decision as to whether or not we should transfer the license. You know, this is um, obviously you know, new information to us. However, uh, the, the, we have no bearing on the, the execution of that corporate entity and, and the way it, it conducts business, though. You know, and all, all we can weigh in on here is the, the, the alcohol license. Yeah. Uh, can sorry. I ask a question on the uh, paperwork that's in here? Now, Michael Kowalczyk, uh, this is the uh, supposedly uh, vote of the board. Now, Michael Kowalczyk signs this as financial secretary. Now, on here, all we have is, and this is directed to the Board of Selectmen, that a motion was made to apply for a change in license type for alcoholic beverages in the Polish Hall. That's all we have here. And then we have a vote, supposedly, of the Board of Directors. Now, this is signed by Michael Kowalczyk, Financial Secretary. Michael Kowalczyk, as Financial Secretary, does not certify any board vote, does not certify any board minutes. That is done by the Recording Secretary clerk. In other words, we have a Recording Secretary, a clerk, that signs, uh, do certifies documents, signs our filings, et cetera. So this, I think the Board of Selectmen should request, and I think it should be a certified request, a uh, certified set of minutes of the vote, or a certified board vote by the clerk. <coughs> Unless we have a, a long history of asking for documents of that nature, I would not recommend that we do the, that. The latest, the latest filing version. doesn't show anybody named Kowalczyk right. associated with it. I have their current, I have their current corporation papers right up here on the computer, and it's showing. The three Kowalczyk years. Is not a, yeah, the three years it hasn't been filed. The clerk, and they haven't right. filed since 2005 with the state. All right, three years they have not filed yeah. as of a couple of days ago. Yeah, that's the other point. Mr. Chairman. So there are some questions. Yeah. When I contacted okay. the EVCC for guidance on this, they did explain that that is their part of their role, is they do, and particularly with this type of license transaction, um, the financial health and matters of the organization are under great scrutiny by the ABCC in terms of contacting Department of Revenue, uh, these other things, exactly as you said, Secretary of State's office confirming everything. So, Let me ask, as far as a procedural issue, do we have to issue the license before the ABC takes no. their action? No. The, the process is the local license, it's a three-step process. The local licensing authority, the Board of Selectmen, approves the license. It's then forwarded to the ABCC they then approve it once it's approved the third step is the license is granted by the board the okay, local so we board are the first step the question though can somebody who's not a corporate officer ask this board to take an action 
because the corporate filings right. don't reflect like this guy Kowalczyk as being responsible for anything in the, in, the, in the club. But we don't know that those corporate filings are accurate. And I remind the board, the board entered into a purchase and sale agreement with a non-existent entity, accepting their word that there was such a thing as Uxbridge Crossing LLC, when in fact nothing, no such thing existed. Um, it did come into being afterwards. I, I tracked it on the corporate file. Yeah, I know that after the fact, yes. Uh, several months after the fact. And only because I raised the issue. Right, I understand that. But there, I mean, there are requirements. So if, if there's no filing here and there's, there's no record of a filing since 2005, mm -hmm. that means they haven't been, fi you have to file an annual report. So in 2006, your officers would have been updated. 2007, your officers would have been updated. 2008, depending on if, actually by 2008, because they're showing filings as of June of 2005. So. I make regular checks with the Secretary of State's website uh, on some of my favorite subjects, one of which is the, the Uxbridge Community Access, UCAT, that corporation formed with town money. And if you go on their website, you will find offices listed uh, seven or eight years ago and no filing since. And they didn't pay the $35 filing, filing fee. Right, we I we issued that. a license to the Whitensville Rod and Gun Club. We didn't inquire as to the bona fides of the gentleman representing the club. The beauty here is. But we also didn't have anybody standing up bringing to our attention that there may be an issue. And, and you know, there, there may or may not be. The beauty of this is that the ABCC will handle that for us. Mr. Chairman, there is a section on the form that I submit, and I also submit all the paperwork with a cover memo attached. There's a section, though, for remarks, and I think if the board has any concerns or anything that the board hasn't been able to verify but you would like the ABCC to be aware of, it would be appropriate for us to include it in that section. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I, I would like to, to, to give Mr. Mason, he he'd indicated he wanted a chance to respond. Yeah, it's just um, the ABCC gives us the okay every year for the license we have now. If there was a problem, I'm sure they would have pointed it out last year, the year before. They signed it and they send it along to us. So there's one thing. And like you stated before, we, what we're going to have to do is get approved here and the ABC is going to look at it again. They can approve it or not approve it. If there is a problem like Rom says, then it'll be squashed at that point. Because this is what this is the procedure that you just get done telling. So to be approved. Where, where, where my unease has come in is looking at the filing. Somebody named Kowalczyk sent us a request who doesn't legally have any basis to make that request mm -hmm. if you go into the court. Well, he is, he is the financial secretary. Not according to Boston. There's no such thing on, the, on those forms as financial secretary. Just as there is no statutory position as finance director but we have a finance director and we recognize him, but in fact, no such position exists under the statutes or in our charter, as a matter of fact. Right, no, I understand what you're saying. They can choose their titles. Here they've chosen president, treasurer, and clerk. Mm -hmm. So if those individuals are no longer in those positions and the people who have stepped in, I think would be the point here. Also, I mean, they're listed as a nonprofit and nonprofits, according to Massachusetts, um, DOR also fall under different requirements. I mean, the fees for nonprofits to update their quarterlies are minimum lift $35. Right. So, I mean, compared to a corporation, it's not like they're looking at the $500 fees that they charge. That's correct. But UCAT hasn't come up with the $35 either. <laughs> right. I, I'm just, I mean, just, Can I just this is a fact. Can I just give more so. information on that? See, the law is, if you miss two filings, then you can lose your child. Now, it has happened. We're nonprofit. They do give you a break because it right. has happened to us before. We reached for, we got a letter, and it said in the letter, we know you're a nonprofit, probably volunteers and so on, so we do give you a break. You do have to pay for four filings. However, the law is two filings, and action can be taken. So, as you pointed out, it is serious. And the fact that this has made a difference with the lottery. Now, I had executed a lottery sales agent agreement. 
and it was very important on what they found listed in the set of filings at the uh, Secretary of State's office. So it is important on who the officers were. I was not included in this particular uh, set. Uh, I should have uh, been uh, because it wasn't complete and it did make the difference. So uh, as you pointed out, uh, they do look at that. And the uh, ABC, a uh, few of these things have been brought up. For example, the payment of taxes, we're treating it very lightly here. But when it gets to the ABC, here we're doing just the taxes at the town level. We have taxes now that are owed. The IRS is looking for money, and we had, uh, I don't know, uh, the town whether they paid it all up or what's going on there. So we have about three different uh, areas where we have to pay some uh, taxes. And the IRS, from what he says, I don't bring it down here, or I can bring it here, but he won't weigh in on it. This is what I was told by legal counsel. Anything that I brought to him, which is violation of the Liquor Control Act and so on, is going to be taken up when it gets there with the license. And one of those is a payment of Commonwealth of Massachusetts taxes. Mm -hmm. So the ABC is going to take that up. So in that case, that I brought up, it's up to them. In that case, it won't go through. But I'm sure um, we're a lot better off than what Ram is stating here. Matter of fact, I know for a fact um, we are. And obviously, we're slow. And I know how you stated that um, we're not into that type of business. But with the insurances and the licenses and everything else, yes, we are in that type of business for selling alcohol because that's our only income. That's the only way we, we get to pay our bills. And the business is so slow because of the shareholders being so few, and a lot of them aren't from this area, we're limited. We have shareholders meeting. We're lucky to get 25 people. We, we have to generate something, some more business somehow. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if I thought for a minute, and we discussed this at the board, that we we're in that kind of much trouble, why would I be standing here? The idea is to, to try to get us some more income um, and pay some of the bills that, that we're waiting on. Now I have to respond as far as the IRS code goes on this. See, uh, all we're hearing is we've got to make all of this money. By law, we are limited to the amount of money that we can bring in from the public. Now, it's 35% of your gross receipts that you can have. 15% of that can be used from the use of your facilities to the public. So we can't just say, oh, we gotta go up there and get all this money. There is a law to be followed. The IRS code is very strict on this. So I would be very careful uh, in accepting something like this, that we want money, and that's why we want this change of license, which is going to affect tax exemption and the payment, the amount of money we're going to be paying. Statewide, we have to change now because right now we're 180, so comes the excise tax, we get the form, and under 180, we pay so much. We pay so much for <coughs> our filings because we are nonprofit. Instead of an $85 filing, we were paying $15. I don't know what it is this year or what, but that's the difference. This isn't, I, I, again, yeah, I, this I, isn't, should be brought again, up the, here, there maybe. may be a number of you know corporate structure issues th that you need to deal with, and that's best handled through like a, a shareholder you know grievance or whatever whatever the process would be uh, in your charter that allows you to do that. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the challenge that we're faced with uh, here this evening is uh, you know if we were to grant this change of license, it would certainly have to be contingent upon uh, adherence to the bylaw, which says you know that local taxes be paid. Um, I, I would want to. Uh, make sure we included uh, a note in the remarks section that the requester uh, on the petition for license transaction is not listed on the state's website as uh, as an officer of the organization. We'll, uh, we'll I got a meeting Thursday night. I'll definitely look okay. into that. Uh, that was I was unaware of that. But. Right. 
Um, we'll, uh, and, and beyond that, you know, it, it really sounds to me as though, you know, the ABCC is going to do a thorough job of kind of, you know, kind of vetting this whole process to make sure that, that the entity is viable uh, in, in order for them to, you know, put their, their name on it as well. Um, so, you know, I, unless there's any other, you know, re relevant discussion this evening, I, I don't, is there anything else you need to add? No? Mr. Chairman, can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, Steve, are your servers all TIP certified? Yes. And that they have recent certifications? Okay. Thanks. That's right. So that protects them more than it protects me. So they, yeah. everybody's. Okay. So, so Steve, I mean, having heard uh, the, the commentary this evening, um, what are your wishes? Do you want to continue on with the process? Oh, absolutely. Or? Okay. Absolutely. Like I said, we, you know, if, if we don't go forth, it's, we're just going to slowly, slowly dissipate because it's, there's, from what our bills are with, uh, I mean, you can go down there. I don't know how many of you have gone by there in the afternoon. I mean, it was mostly old timer, um, time and a lot of them have passed on. I mean, we, Last Monday, uh, we didn't bring in much over $100 for the whole day, so I lost money. And regardless of, of what you would like to keep it as, um, you just can't run it anymore like that. We, we need somehow, some ways, um, and my ears are open to everybody I talk to, what we can do. But the situation is what it is, and right now the board came through, and the shareholders have been informed on it. Um, the board did come through with this is the best thing. I mean, we questioned. Uh, um, Dick Moore uh, and many other people meet, and this is the, the route they told us to go. So, okay. okay. Well, I, I guess are you looking for a motion? Well, not yet. I, is there anyone else in the, from the public that wanted to weigh in on this? No. Okay. I'm, I'm going to close the public commentary. Right. Questions from the board or anything else? No. 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 I, do I have a motion or? Yeah, I, I moved. Hmm? Or do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering. You actually talk to the shareholders and form the shareholders? Yes, the shareholders, well, we've been talking about this for quite a few meetings. And what we end up doing, there was no official vote taken on it, but what they end up saying is, you know what, we believe in you board. You guys were elected to this position, the officers and the board. We feel that you can carry this to what you decide, because you guys know the numbers and everything else and the mm -hmm. way the business is going. So basically, they left it up to us. To, to make the decision, but they are informed about. Okay, this is on tape, so yeah. if you yeah. say they're informed. It's been, it's been brought up several okay. several meetings. Okay, okay I, I move that we did grant. Did you close the public hearing? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, okay. public hearing is closed. Move that we grant the request with uh, two conditions. One, that we receive uh, payment for all outstanding local taxes, real estate taxes, excise taxes, whatnot and that we receive some sort of a corporate fi a copy of a corporate filing yeah, we'll that, that reflects that the applicant is in fact a corporate officer definitely okay okay Do I have a second second okay any more discussion <laughs> call for the vote all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. thank you Thanks. Okay. All right, next on the agenda, uh, briefing from National Grid on the high voltage electric transmission line to be built in an existing right of way. Uh, Mike? Have any flip charge you want me to hold for you? Or? Wow. <laughs> God bless you for being selectman. Yeah. Uh, hopefully this uh, presentation, which is informal and uh, informational, will be a little bit less controversy. In any case, my name is Michael Peterson, and I'm the local manager for the electric company. National Grid in this area. And it's interesting that the beginning parts of today's meeting was concerning um, economic development. And whether it's on a high level or a low level, uh, we have gotten to the point where electricity is no longer a luxury. It really is something that has to flow. It's something that everybody needs. And this presentation looks at a very high level situation regarding power and moving power precisely around southern New England. Uh, my associates, Ron Galuli and Dave Barron, uh, will be doing a structured step-by-step -step presentation as to what we've been doing, uh, what we are doing, how we involve the public, and what our hope and desire is for the future. 
And with that, except for the fact that uh, David is an engineer, so I'll ask you to bear with him. Um, Mr. Barron. Thanks for that qualifier, Mike. <laughs> Mr. Chairman of the board, thank you very much for, for having us tonight. Um, and actually, part of the reason we wanted to get on your agenda tonight was to sort of give you a, a courtesy notification that we're actually uh, <clears throat> planning what we call an open house event uh, where members of the public can come in and learn more about the project um, and meet with the project team, uh, ask questions, et cetera. And we're going to be holding that, I believe it's November 6th, uh, at the Quaker Inn. Uh, so we'll make sure that uh, uh, the board uh, gets gets invitations to the open house as well. Uh, but as, as Mike uh, Peterson mentioned, uh, we're here to talk about a, a transmission project. Uh, and to sort of make an analogy to a highway system, uh, transmission lines are, are sort of the super highways uh, of the electric utility industry. Uh, transmission lines move large amounts of bulk power uh, long distances from where it's produced uh, at, at remote generating stations uh, long distances to where it's consumed. And um, why transmission projects are important and needed, uh, obviously to meet peak demand. Over recent years, uh, we have a slide on this coming up, but uh, demand has increased significantly. It's also important to preserve the reliability of electric service. Uh, a certain amount of redundancy is needed in the system uh, to protect uh, reliability when elements of the system are either out of service on a planned or unplanned basis. Um, if, if we don't have this redundancy and this robustness in the system, we can have uh, equipment overloads and voltage problems. And much like a highway system, actually the transmission network can have congestion, uh, bottlenecks, uh, which actually drives up uh, the price of electricity. Uh, the, the, the transmission system enhances competitive electric markets and it allows, uh, if it's robust enough, uh, the most cost-effective electricity be, to be delivered uh, to the users. But just a little bit about demand. This is a pretty astounding number here. Uh, this is all of New England. Uh, since 1980 uh, to 2006, nearly doubling uh, the peak demand of electricity in, in uh, New England. Now, that's, that's a big jump in a relatively short amount of time. And if we look at Massachusetts, it's over a 40% increase just since 1991 in that, in that same, you know, to 2006. So very significant growth has, has occurred, um, but the, sort of the infrastructure hasn't really kept pace with that. Uh, much of the existing transmission network was built out uh, sort of post-World War II and dates back to the late 40s and early 50s uh, in, in some of the, in, in the 60s as well. Uh, this slide is talking more about some drivers of, of, of the need. I mentioned aging infrastructure. We're hearing a lot uh, now about renewable uh, energy uh, resources. And the more robust and, and sort of uh, rigorous the, the transmission network is, the more able such uh, renewable energy developments like wind power um, are able to interconnect and deliver power into the system. And the last bullet there is fairly obvious. You know, reliable electricity is needed to support our infrastructure, schools, hospitals, uh, emergency response, water, sewer, et cetera. So all that in context, uh, the actual transmission network in New England is administered by an entity called the ISO of New England. That stands for Independent System Operator. And as the name implies, they're an independent nonprofit organization that, that really is uh, responsible for administering the electric marketplace, planning the electric system. Um, and back about three, well, three plus years, almost four years ago, they, uh, they started a study of the New England system, the network, uh, to see how it measured against reliability criteria. And national grid planners participated in that study along with ISO planners and uh, planners from Connecticut Northeast Utilities. And they identified five regional uh, concerns with the, with the network, and they're illustrated on this slide. Uh, sort of the overarching concern is this east-west New England constraint that's shown there. Um, if you were to superimpose the network, the transmission lines on this map, you'd see 
very readily that a majority of them are, are north-south oriented and inherent in that is an inability for the system to move power effectively from east to west or west to east, sort of like congestion or a, a bottleneck. Uh, the, other, the other problems that were identified by this study, which was really sort of the, the largest study that had been done probably within 30 years, uh, but very uh, specific uh, concerns around uh, and significant concerns around the Springfield area, the greater Rhode Island area, and then this interstate transfer capacity uh, issue where, again, the system did not have the ability to move power effectively between the three southern New England states, Mass, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And then there was a, an east-west constraint in Connecticut that was also identified. And what came out of this after looking at oh, thousands actually of, of possible solutions to these problems were a collection of four projects that taken together address the five problems. And the one we're here to talk to you about tonight is illustrated uh, in, by the blue arrows, the Interstate Reliability Project. There's the uh, Greater Springfield Project, the Central Connecticut Project, and a Rhode Island Project that are all planned. But what we wanted to talk to you about tonight is the Interstate Reliability Project because it is planned uh, and proposed uh, partly within, within, within your town. And in all cases, all four projects are connecting existing uh, electrical hubs or substations uh, with new 345,000 volt transmission lines. And these lines are proposed uh, to be located along existing corridors. Um, I mentioned several thousand different solutions that were studied. Um, it was actually remarkable. The, the, the system is really so interconnected that the planners would fix a problem in the Springfield area and make something in Rhode Island worse or vice versa. So they really had to go through this rigorous analysis and, and boil it down to those solutions that worked electrically. And once we had that, we used these five criteria to, to further evaluate the options and pare it down to the, the, uh, the, the projects that we're now proposing. And uh, it was network performance and long-term flexibility uh, human and natural environment impacts, our ability to deliver the project, and obviously cost has to be a, a consideration. <coughs> this slide illustrates uh, the interstate reliability project route. Um, it originates at our existing substation in Millbury, Massachusetts, uh, and goes along an existing corridor through Sutton. Um, it catches just the tip of Northbridge, uh, enters into Uxbridge and, and Millville, <coughs> where it ties into a, uh, a subst an existing substation in northern Rhode Island in North Smithfield, uh, the West Farm substation. It then across goes uh, easterly and ties into a, a substation in Connecticut called Lake Road. So again, this is a new 345,000 volt transmission line that's proposed uh, on this existing corridor. Um, this discusses some of the benefits of the reliability project. I, I talked about some of the problems, and I won't read this to you, but uh, really uh, enhancing the reliability, reducing bottlenecks and congestion, and of course there's local tax benefits to host communities. These, these, these facilities are taxed like uh, property, uh, regular property taxes. Uh, I think our rough estimate at this point would be about $150,000 annual tax income uh, to Uxbridge. Next slide, Mark. Uh, this, this provides a visual simulation of, of what the project is proposed to look like, and this is a view from uh, William Street uh, facing south. And on the left there, that's sort of the before. There's, a, there's actually two existing transmission lines. One of them is a little hard to see there. Um, those are 115,000 volt lines. And in the far right of that left-hand picture, you see uh, an old tower line. Now that's actually a, it used to be a 69,000 volt transmission line that was decommissioned. Uh, the conductors were removed, but the towers were left uh, in place to monument the right of way. And what we're proposing to do is actually build the new uh, 345,000 volt line in place of that lattice tower, take that old tower down. And that's illustrated on the right hand picture here. So on the right is sort of a visual sim simulation to show what the project would look like. Uh, some of what we've been doing over the last 12 months, actually almost a year ago, I think it was September, we, we did meet with your town manager, uh, Ms. Myers, uh, just to let her know that we were going to start getting out in the field uh, to do some environmental studies. We've done things like wetlands delineation, 
uh, archaeological reconnaissance, rare threatened endangered species surveys, that sort of thing. We've also been advancing the engineering and, and sort of constructability analysis and coordinating both with Northeast Utilities and the ISO. And another real big thing that we've been doing is early public outreach. And I'm not going to steal Ron Galuli's thunder. He's going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing along those lines. But it's been re really, uh, uh, it's probably the, the most significant outreach effort we've had uh, on any project I, I can recall. Um, hey, Dave, qu a quick question. Yes. What's the capacity of the three lines that are already there that coming down William Street? Uh, the two that are active are 115,000 volt yep. transmission lines and the one the other one is really a decommissioned line that it doesn't carry any power. So they're 115 each? 115,000 each, yes. Okay, so that's 230, and then what we're adding is 345? Yep, okay. 345. The, the 115 kV system is really sort of serves local load, and the, the 345 system is more of a bulk. Regional transfer. Regional really. transfer. Um, but again, very important to support local needs, but uh, it doesn't... You know, it's not going into your, your house, obviously, but okay. uh, moves, moves power between regions. Okay. That, Kevin, one of the 115 lines that's in the right of way right now provides the bulk power to the substation that's located in Uxbridge that's over by the Burnett Mills. Okay. Um, this is a very high level sort of uh, milestone schedule. We're, we're continuing with planning and engineering uh, through 2009. Um, early next year, we're going to be starting our, our permitting and licensing process. As you can imagine, for a project of this nature, it's, uh, it's a pretty intense and lengthy process. We expect that to take the better part of 18 months to two years. Um, so it, it's sort of early days yet. I guess that's the message tonight. We're here early just to let you know we want to talk to folks early, uh, but we're not anticipating starting construction until uh, 2010 and having the facilities and service. Uh, early 2013. So, um, and through that whole period, we'll be doing continuing community outreach and communications. And again, Ron will talk very briefly about that. And, and one thing we're going to do too is also give you sort of a tour through the town in Google Earth of, of where this is. And you can sort of see what it's near, where it runs. Uh, but again, we'll attempt to be brief. Uh, next slide, just to sort of uh, give you some satisfaction that it is. Uh, an intense licensing process and, and a lot of people, are, a lot of eyes are going to be on it. Uh, this just lists some of the approvals that we have to seek. Everything from federal permits from the Army Corps uh, down to local permits from uh, your Conservation Commission, for example. But Mass Siting Board, Mass DPU are all uh, significant processes, as is the, the MEPA process. So um, a, lot, a lot to work through. And I guess the other message with that is uh, a lot of opportunity in these processes and, and here in the town uh, for, for public input uh, uh, and comment. So hopefully that gives you a little comfort that a, a lot of folks and agencies are, are looking at the proposal. Um, we'll let Ron talk and then maybe um, if there are any questions we can answer them then if that suits you. Fine. You don't want a question now? I, I, I'm happy to, however you want to do it. I'll forget. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's fine. <laughs> So you're going to build this 375,000 volt transmission line in, on your existing right of way. That's correct. And it's going to take two years to go through all the permitting and schmermitting that you have to do, right? Yes. We're doomed. <laughs> I want to tell you, we're doomed. That's the process we have to live with. Yeah. That's our life. Yes, but we're the ones that are doomed. Did you find any evidence of... Uh, ancient Egyptian pyramids when you did the archaeological <laughs> nope. study? No pyramids. No but pyramids. No, no pyramids. Yeah. But, you know, the, obviously the, the valley and surrounding areas were, you know, widely used by, by Native Americans, so there, there's some of that. And we also have to consider uh, sort of historic structures in that analysis. So, again, there's a lot of agencies that have did you, you know, very... Uh, when you went along this existing right-of-way that you've been traveling on in all these years, did you find any existing historic stu structures that you were not previously aware of? Um, I'll have to consult the report. Uh, not that I'm, I'm aware of, no structures. Mm -hmm. uh, likely there were some, some artifacts here and there. Whether they were in any uh, sort of undisturbed context where they were meaningful, uh, that's debatable, but we're, we're sort of in that analysis still. And that's all information we have to 
uh, present when we make applications to the siting board and the DPU. So they, they look at all those factors. One quick technical question before you go away. Um, the town has, will have again before it an application for a power plant, a, a uh, peaking plant. And the reason it's proposed as a peaking plant is because the, the existing transmission lines don't have the capacity to absorb the power. But as I understand your presentation, this won't help that. Uh, unless, unless this will take some of the load off the 110,000 uh, volt line. Yeah, I, I, I may just interject here. Um, when we did hear about the peaking plant, we did read about it in the newspaper. Uh, I did check with our transmission account managers, and they had no application for the peaking plan. So I'm not sure they're, if they're aware of our plans for the additional line within the existing corridor or not, but I do know the proximity of that proposed plant is right near the corridor. Yes, but, but this is a higher voltage line that wouldn't, wouldn't change the capacity of your existing line unless it, you shed some of the load from that. Let me make the observation that there has been a group looking to develop a power plant within the Blackstone Valley, yeah. and they've been looking at different sites over the last 12 months, and in most of those inquiries, their request has been on the 115,000 volt line as an input source. Right. Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, at that point, they didn't know about the opportunity that we might be building a 345,000. Okay. But okay. generally speaking, They'll go into a 115,000 volt line yeah. opportunity to get it in the system, yeah. so to speak. Okay. We, we have, we receive revenues from National Grid, is it now? Uh, for the generator we have at the DPW as a standby basis. Oh, okay. Yep. You get a um, special rate. Yeah. yeah, will we lose that? No. In no, any way? no. Okay, it's good. totally unrelated. All right. Okay. And that's actually with a private company. Um, you had mentioned that there was 150,000 annual tax revenue to the town of Uxbridge from these lines. Is that beyond what we're currently getting? Yeah, that's in, that's incremental, and I have to stress, you know, that that's sort of a rough estimate. My right. my sort of expectation is actually it'll probably be a little higher than that, but you know, it is it is sort of really we're still compiling estimates and sort of refining estimates. But so undersell, over deliver, right? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, undersell, over deliver, right? So the uh, <laughs> expectation is low and exceed them. So right. Good philosophy. But yeah. that wouldn't Surprise. until. But that would not be something that we would see until 2013 when the it whole project was completed. Right. And well, and actually, actually yeah, that's a good question though, because there will be infrastructure improvements uh, and you know capital investment made prior to 2013. So wouldn't someone that be taxable as soon as the infrastructure improvements are made? I think it can only be paid once it's sort of active and, and on the books, um, you know, in service, essentially. Okay. Yeah, there's the construction working process regulations. Okay. And while I'm not a lawyer and don't need to represent that I could speak to one, but my understanding is, is that's the way the, uh, the rules and regulations are written. Okay. I think the other point I should probably make that $150,000 or whatever the figure ends up being is sort of year one, right? And that's depre that depreciates over maybe, I think it's 40 years, I want to say, Mike. So that goes down a little bit every year, but. Uh, Did you say four or 40? 40. 40. 40, okay, yeah. just so people. It's either 30 or 40, I'm sort of not recalling. I, I think it's 40. 40, we think long term. 40 sounds good. So. <laughs> okay. um, so if there's no other immediate questions, we'll let Ron speak a little bit about what he's been doing with his team uh, in terms of community relations and public outreach, and we'll give you a, a quick Google Earth tour, and if there's more questions, we're happy to take them. Thank you, Dave. And uh, just following up on the uh, question about the artifacts within the right-of-way, on our Whiten's Pond project, which we completed uh, last year, we actually did a site walk with a representative from the Wampanoag tribe, uh, Bettina Washington, and uh, I was on that site walk, and she did uh, find what she, well, it was an arrowhead, uh, what she called an arrowhead. And um, so they were present when we were digging the structures off the Sutton Street in the cornfield there. So Northbridge. Northbridge, Sutton, uh, in Oxbridge there. So uh, we, do, we do keep them involved and keep, keep them aware. I found arrowheads on my property. I didn't call anybody from an Indian tribe. I just put them in my... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, 
what we've been doing on community relations end here. Uh, again, we're committed to working with local officials and res residents throughout the whole process. We've been out there early and often. Um, we did meet with the town manager, Jill, here uh, last year at this time. Uh, since then, uh, we've been dropping packets off with residents. We've met with residents in the town. Uh, our second phase of outreach to the residents will be starting this week. We're finishing up a sister project in Rhode Island and we'll be moving them up this way and then we'll have the open house event in November. Uh, we've also had uh, meetings with state and local officials as early as 2006. Uh, we did a right away audit for the entire route in Massachusetts. That's simply driving up and down the corridor, looking at homes that are very close uh, to the transmission lines and marking them down and identifying those abutters. Those are the people we're targeting for our early outreach. Uh, to date, in Massachusetts, we've had 28 abutter visits, and I expect that number to go over 50 uh, probably within the next couple of weeks. So uh, we're hitting our targets. We were hoping to visit with at least 50% of the people that we originally identified. Uh, we've notified residents and employees within our towns and retirees. Um, reason for that is some of the retirees or employees may be considered the expert at National Grid, so the neighbors hear about the project. Uh, they come to them asking questions. Now these, these people know about the project. They may be able to answer simple questions or at least refer them to, uh, to the project team. We had media briefings in April. We also had a municipal forum where municipal officials and local officials were invited uh, to learn more about the project. Um, we also do email lists for notifications. So right now I've been compiling the email list and we'll get a notification out about the open house events. But more importantly, once we get to construction, that email list serves as a construction notification list. So we send project updates out weekly once we're in, in, right into the construction season. Um, we did this quite successfully in Rhode Island where we just completed 12 miles of new transmission line and we had weekly updates with very specific uh, information about where crews would be working and the like. Uh, we've been listening to the people we've been talking to, and one of the most common complaints we do get is unauthorized activity within the right-of-way. This is a picture of our project in Rhode Island. Uh, these gates and guardrails did not exist at the right-of-way entrance, and we put gates and guardrails at every crossroad uh, on that project. We have budgeted for gates and guardrails along every crossroad as long as the uh, property owners, if we're not the property owner, grants us permission, we'll install those gates and guardrails. And with that, uh, I'd like to give you a brief tour of the project. Um, this is slick. Right here, I, uh, I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit, but uh, this shows you the, the Uxbridge area going down. Here's uh, Route 16 and down toward, toward Millville. And now I'm going to zoom into the beginning uh, town line. I'm not sure where it is, but this is Lackey Dam Road right here. And we can zoom in. And the new structures, we actually have the specific locations are modeled within the right of way. So you can see structure number 68 is right there. And that's the, uh, the H frame structure that, that we did uh, view in that simulation. Uh, this is very helpful in the open house. People can come in and we can show them how close their home is within uh, the existing structure we can actually measure within very accurate uh, distances uh, to tell them the locations. Hey, hey Ron, on, on that one there, is, was 72 the existing or 60, 68 is the existing, 72 uh, is the new? 68 is the proposed, 72 is the existing. Okay. So in, in Uxbridge, um, the first part of Uxbridge, the proposed line is on the west side of the right of way. And a little further down on the route, it switches over and goes on the east side. But for the most part, Uxbridge is on the west side of the right of way. Is there anywhere in Uxbridge um, where you will exceed your current right of way? No. Okay. This is uh, what we call the Whitens <coughs> Pond Tap area. And we actually just completed the project last summer, uh, adding a new line in this tap line corridor to uh, substation uh, Whitens Pond in Northridge. And uh, 
I don't know if there's any Google Earth users in the room, but um, a only geek like me would notice this. Uh, I zoomed in, in on this, and this was uh, this picture had to be taken in June last year. The reason I know that that uh, r what looks like a road is actually timber mats on that right away, and that's just before we installed the new structures. So that, these pictures are as as new as June of last year. Um, you can see that right away was uh, widened in the winter. We also uh, do meet with people, and we have a web-based contact management tool that my, my guys that work with me use, and we, uh, we also put notes in Google Earth so that we can deploy this to the field personnel. So they, they know we've worked with the public liaisons over here, and we can include any type of notes, whether email, contact information, you know, watch the horses, or you know, he wants wood, or whatever. Uh, we can keep that information uh, right in Google Earth and send that out to the field people. We can also put at the access roads in here as well. Um, moving down through Uxbridge, we, uh, we're crossing here at William Street, and we met with the Perinis, and one of the, we got some feedback from them that uh, they're not real happy with the proposed structure location here, so we're actually going to propose it to move it across the street here. That'll probably move one of the structures up a little bit on that side. Um, but that, this is the type of dialogue we, we like to have with people early on uh, before we actually uh, have shovels in the ground. We're going south, this is a Bangma Dairy Farm, and we cross West Hartford Road here. This is mostly a wooded area, and this is, uh, is it Hazel, Hazel Street here? Mm -hmm. Cross Hazel. And now we're about to cross uh, Route 16. This is the uh, condominium complex. We did meet with them earlier this summer. Um, actually, some of these are real new because some of these, there's some condos right here. So it does pass by uh, fairly close to the condo complex here. Again, moving south. I'm sorry. This is High Street. Here is the tap to Uxbridge substation. We actually did model this. Um, so you can see those, those, that, that's where the tap off is, the Uxbridge substation. That's the existing one just south of this building. Yeah. Now this area here, we've met with uh, Kathy over here and uh, been working with her. She's been, she's been a pleasure to work with and I guess she has family members that live around here too. Uh, did meet with her brother as well. This is kind of a funny area. You can see our right away actually diverges out here, but we plan to stay within the main line right away. Uh, for the most part, the right away is fully cleared. This section here, there will be some tree clearing associated with this section because the right away is a little narrow there. And you can see it, it merges back up, and we go to the, the, the same width here. And I believe this is Mill Street here. Moving south, that's uh, 146A. And we're about to cross over, and that's right here. Uh, right after we went across the river, you can see where the line actually flips sides. So we went from the west side, and now we're on the east side of the right of way uh, for the remainder down into Rhode Island. And again, uh, now I think we're getting close to Millville or in Millville. So again, we can, we can zoom in at any location and we'll know exactly where these structures, these are pretty accurate where these structures will be located. And we will meet with, in the field with people and actually show them the, pro, uh, the locations of these structures within the proximity of their home so they know what's coming. Uh, with that, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take any additional questions. So in, in the folder I passed out, we had a copy of all the slides, but there's also a fact sheet. Um, and we actually, we did a similar presentation, I think, last week to Millville. They asked that we give them a supply of these just to leave them in the town hall for folks who are interested. So if you're pleased, you can also get it to you electronically. That would be great if we can maybe link it to our website. That'd be great. Yes, sir. Do you replace walls when you take them down? 
Pardon? Do you replace walls when you smash them down? So more so, walls. So more walls. Yes. Yeah. How about the one in the hundred acre lot that you pushed over the still over? There's a couple on top of the I know. The town property. Yeah, I know. You know in the back when you come in the back way? Yeah. That used to be solid. Now I see it's an opening there, but it's just open the last time I was by there. There's not, there's not a gate there, right? There, there used to be up until this last time, but before that was a solid wall. Then there was a gate, so now there's nothing. Okay, well, we'll look yeah, at that. And I noticed you pushed it down and you put fill in there, but you never put the wall back. Okay, yeah, I'm, I apologize for that. I, I wasn't aware of that. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I was born there. <laughs> You gotta go west a little bit. Okay. Yeah. See where they come through into the hundred acre? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's right down here. That was we'll check that out. Over here, sir. There's some uh some issues there. Just on the bottom into the hundred acre lot. Down this way? It's down towards uh down towards your station. Okay. Oh down here. Mike. Um, who should be Ernie's contact point for this? I, I don't want to well, derail the meeting. This is one it's probably better to have Ron go Lily. Yeah. Okay. And feel free to, you know, Ron's telephone number is yeah. in the booklet, but people can call me also. You know, I don't know the number. I can always get that. Ron, can you give your card to Mr. Ebling? Okay. Thanks. You can call Ron. Any questions from the board? I think that on my computer, I think. Any questions, guys? Does the board have any other no. questions? Uh, Peter? No, I just want Dave's uh, card or your phone number or something. Yep. I saw the Absolutely. bigger presentation. It doesn't tell mm -hmm. you so much ago. Well, we do the Google Maps. It's pretty good. Cool. Cool. Consistency it's safe. It's so helpful. It's actually scarce. <laughs> Probably on the selections case, go through the town manager. But you don't have to. But at least they come through Ronnie or I. Because we do try to log them so we make sure that things, questions like this are lost quite frankly. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I guess what you didn't present here that you've done in the past was uh, to allay health concerns that people have that live by there. So you might want to consider that when you do the open house in November. Uh, be prepared for that sort of questions, I guess. Yeah, yeah we, we, we will have a station that addresses uh, electromagnetic fields. Our community relations reps do carry Gauss meters, so if people do have uh, requests for readings, we take a baseline reading and a request. We'll eventually have the right-of-way modeled. They can compare that model, the model data to the, the baseline information, and then similar to what we did in Rhode Island, we'll, we'll go by, back afterwards and take readings after the project's complete. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want to go over your report while they're breaking things down? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to keep my eye on that one. Thank you. Thank you for putting it away. Okay. Um, I have a brief report for you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Insurance Advisory Committee had met on September 17th. That's an employee committee uh, made up of union representatives, a retiree rep, and a management representative. Um, with Irving departing, we didn't have a management rep. So um, David happened to be at the meeting, and the, the rumor had it that he was appointed. I, I had not appointed him as the rep. Uh, I didn't know if there might be a conflict or a perceived conflict because he's the resource person. Um, but the group agreed that there was no conflict and David was appointed by me verbally and was then subsequently elected chairman of the Insurance Advisory Committee. So um, he, and he, it was a surprise <laughs> to both of us, but he, he welcomed uh, that unanimous vote by them. Uh, we had a, a, an interesting presentation by our Blue Cross Blue Shield rep. Uh, majority of the town employees do subscribe to that 
uh, provider. And so we talked a lot about how to control costs, but look at it also as part of a wellness component of trying to prevent the disease in the first place. And so we'll uh, hopefully roll out something uh, with our insurance consultants, um, David and um, Oops, forget her name. Laura Lively, and we'll take the road, the show on the road, so that we can go to DPW and have someone speak to the DPW employees specifically related, related to what they might encounter on the job. So that's uh, up and coming. They're also looking into some additional voluntary programs. These programs don't require collective bargaining because it's voluntary. We're going to look into those, and hopefully, with a uh, a new. Um, New Year with the Insurance Advisory Committee, uh, hopefully implement some uh, cost-saving mechanisms. Right after the meeting, uh, the Public Employees Committee met. That's the PEC. They're the ones who vote via coalition bargaining that the board adopted, Section 19, to enter into the GIC, and that requires an MOU uh, with the town, uh, with the Board of Selectmen. Um, they discussed some of their reasonings why they didn't see the GIC as a viable option for them, uh, primarily because they were satisfied with the current providers. Blue Cross Blue Shield is not a part of the GIC. They felt that if they went to a comparable uh, provider, it might, in fact, cost the town more, but there hasn't been a survey of the membership to see who they would cross over to. Um, some comparable plans are, are tufts that we don't have now that they might go and part of the GIC also offers Fallon so we don't know if there would be a, a migration over to those but they uh, took their vote and presented to you thank you uh, their uh, response to the boards in my inquiry about the status of the GIC consideration uh, that needs to be provided uh, to the GIC by October 1st 2008 and that's for plan offerings for fiscal year 10, which is July 1st, uh, 2009. Uh, there's a letter that uh, Chairman uh, Cruz had drafted that we're going to send out to the legislators tomorrow uh, regarding the request to make it more flexible for the BOS to actually take the vote to enter the GIC rather than uh, coalition bargaining. Uh, other towns have said the same, so hopefully there will be some um, amendments to that coming forward. Uh, we have a grant award of 35000 for technology. It's offered through the Cisco Foundation. The Can office. I just ask a question first. H has that letter actually gone out yet? Uh, I, I signed it tonight. It'll okay. go out tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the technology grant is through Cisco Foundation. Um, it's a, an arm of the Cisco Corporation, and uh, the town accountant's office found that. We were awarded 35000 in grant funds to update the website and the telecommunications, so uh, hopefully update the phone system that is an automated system and we can use the system to a greater capacity than individual lines coming in and hopefully providing a cost savings. But also with our website is a different module that um, some of the larger cities such as uh, Somerville are using and it's called Summerstat. And what it is, it's not exactly what we're having here. It's a little mini version of it, but it's being able to track citizen inquiries, have a, an email request come in for uh, service, work order, or pothole notification, and automatically generates uh, a notification to the resident of the status. So staff on our end will input uh, the the status of the complaint or, or um, issue that's of concern, and the residents would be emailed automatically. Also, people can subscribe to various email lists so that if they're interested in, say, the Board of Health uh, agenda or minutes, they can subscribe so it automatically gets sent out to them. And that's a, a component of the software, which will uh, provide better communication with our residents, but no impact to staff time, uh, which is something that we need to look to, especially with our upcoming budget cycle. Um, so with that, it's called GovLink. I'm sorry, eGovLink is the module that we're looking at, and hopefully we'll be able to get that implemented soon. I haven't had any meetings with the department heads on this regarding the implementation. We're still working out the details, but wanted to announce the grant award to the board. Um, we're also uh, 
I'm sorry, with the, the next item is DPW superintendent recruitment. I know there's an item on your agenda tonight to talk about uh, potential additional duties um, of the town manager serving as a DPW superintendent. Right now, uh, because of some vacation schedules, I'll be meeting with the, the two candidates that were identified by the panel, which consisted of um, Selectman Desolitz, Robertson, uh, our director of planning and economic development, as well as the town manager from the town of Willis, town of Millis, who also serves uh, as the DPW superintendent. So I have the next step plan. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen uh, as soon as I had thought. So we're going to be meeting. I'll be meeting with them on September 30th, causing a little delay to this. And then I want to report tonight that the Exbridge Business Association has reestablished its subcommittee. Uh, to serve as the government liaison. We had met uh, up until about a year and a half ago with them and kept very active, and then they had a change in leadership, which they hope to uh, reinstate the liaison. So that's really worked well with myself. Uh, finance director had made presentations to them around budget time, and I know they've met with our director of planning and economic development on a regular basis as well. My rewards, we're doing what we can to manage our risk. Uh, risk management will uh, relieve our premiums for our property and casualty insurance. Kim's been attending the seminars and uh, will hopefully serve in the capacity of a train the trainer, especially with MCAD training that she's received. And that will be available to both the municipal and school departments. We just received today the calendar of the events. The more trainings that we participate in, the more relief we get on our uh, premiums. So we can save up to a percent or actually get a rebate back as uh, part of the rewards program. We're continuing to meet with uh, the unions. We have a SCIU negotiation that just occurred. Uh, Selefman Petaski is serving on the team with myself and uh, Scott Freitas, our police chief. Our next meeting is on September 30th. And I have a meeting scheduled with our fire chief as well as the North Bridgetown manager and their fire chief on ways that we possibly could have you know, shared services or sub-regional services. And I know that was important for the board uh, coming out of the budget cycle. Any questions? No. Right, thank you. Yeah. A question on the uh, phone system. Mm -hmm. uh, will that also be expanding uh, upstairs to the school administration? Does that have the capacity to do that? And is that in the plans? I know that the town accountant had um, met with the school department and right now that's going to remain separate. Is there a financial reason that it should, should remain separate? Or? I'm not sure if it's a financial or um, a techno, techno, technical, technology. Technological? Sorry. Yes, <laughs> issue. And it's early still. I don't know, Kim, if you had any dealings with that. Sure. Yeah, can we just circle back on that again? Just sure. I'd like to understand. Because if we're you know, putting a, an improved phone system in, if there's, unless there's a real legitimate reason not to, to bridge the systems or mm -hmm. To just have one consolidated system, I you know see a lot of good reasons to have everybody on the same system. We currently have, if we dial like 701, we can meet, we can get to the superintendent's office, but I, we're not sharing a server at that time. So I'll check with Justin on it. Okay. Any other questions? No, just a, a comment. When we have, I know you have things on the agenda with numerical designations, but. When we have people in the audience who are going to speak to us, maybe we can reshuffle things because the manager is going to be here through the whole night anyway. So, okay. just for the future. All right, under old business, uh, Douglas Street property, uh, receive update uh, from Louis Tocino and uh, Jerry Lamar. Presenting Louis Tocino. Um, we just have a quick and brief update um, on our progress with the purchase and sale with uh, CBL and Associates for the Douglas Street property. So I have a few things I'd like to pass around. There's a few copies of the letter there. And I just want to keep everything open, and if anyone has any questions at this time for any of us, we'll be happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, and we had three copies of each. Okay. And I'm not sure if anybody didn't get a chance to look at that book. That's the company. Oh, they don't have enough of Tracy, can you explain your purchase and sale with uh, CD? CBL. Uh, CBL, is it so they're not developing it, they're actually going to purchase the property? That's the plan? No, their, their plan is to develop it into a retail development center. That's what they do. So we kind of have a long term, um, we'll be closing once the project is built, fully permitted and built. But Mr. Ticino? They, they do build. Okay, it's not that they're trying to. You know, sell it and pawn it off. They they own it. They buy it. They own it. So you you won't own it then. No, anymore. nothing to do with it. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, are you aware of the conditions of the purchase and sale agreement? Yes, I'm very aware. But the conditions of the purchase and sale agreement. I don't have interpretation. The document speaks for itself. Yeah, the document is contingent. I've heard that phrase, but again, Jerry, the, the document speaks for itself. Right. That's opposition to it. Tracy, I'm sorry, I jumped in with a question. Do you want to go over an overview and then you can talk about the purchase and sale agreement? or? Um, if there's any specific questions, I think now we just want to make sure that everyone knows um, we're moving forward with this land, the project land, the 43D um, priority development site for Oxbridge, and um, you know we have a signed letter of intent with CBL, and they're you know legitimate, and we're moving forward. Um, yes. Um. <laughs> Help me if I overstep anything that I'm not supposed to. <laughs> can't kick you from here, but I'll try. <laughs> Just stay, stop, okay. Um, when is, you have a signed letter of intent. Um, when do you anticipate closing on that? When the project is complete, when the land is full, fully permitted. And when, when the land is permitted or when the... The, the project is complete as in a complete build out and they're ready to open their doors. Well, it'll probably be done in phases. I'm unsure as to what their system is, but. I would say within less than a year and a half. Okay, less than a year and a half for the permits to be complete? No, no. For Start. the project to be completed. For the project to be completed. Um. Okay. I guess my question, then how does that, I thought there was a September 30th deadline on the table. How does that affect this? That, that's something that <clears throat> they have until September 30th to get their permits. <clears throat> if they wanted to get their permits. It's like <clears throat> a power plant power plant going to buy a piece of land. It's contingent on the land being rezoned. If it doesn't get rezoned, the power plant can still buy that land. These are contingencies that were in there to protect the buyer so that the buyer did not have to perform if they didn't have their permits. This gentleman's willing to perform either way. Which gentleman? Myself. Okay. But this says that you're flipping it to CBO? Yes. Or you are CBO? No, no, I'm flipping. No, he's flipping. The, the purchase and sale agreement was signed pursuant to a response to our request for proposals, which was very specific. So you need to look at the response to the request for proposals and the purchase and sale agreement, which also makes reference to the, the proposal. And it talks in, in detail about closing with dates certain and so forth. And 
time is of the essence, and these things have been reiterated. Um, the young lady indicated that she is familiar with the purchase and sale. I'm sure they're familiar with the request for proposals and the response there too. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm wondering is who's going to go through the permit process, Mr. Tosino or CBL? No, CBL and Associates will be doing all the permitting. <coughs> and they're going to have that all done by the by September 30th. They work fast. Again, that's a, you know, that's a, that, as far as, you know, Mr. Finn and I is here to explain that, that's why he's here. And, uh, you know, we, we feel that that deal was put in for the buyer's protection from the town. And we've got a hold of Mr. Roberti, who also said he put that in there because of the buyer's protection from the town, that, you know, they didn't have to buy it if they couldn't get permits. But we don't, you know, we're buying it, okay? We have a buyer, we have, Tracy here got everything together, uh, they're purchasing it, they're a billion dollar company, you know, if you look at their portfolio, and uh, they're, they're buying it, that's that's what they're doing. Now, if you, you want a shopping center there, they're buying it. And you're gonna get your money, right? Your million two, okay, uh, by the 29th, you know? Providing you give me a deed, okay, or whatever you have to do, and that's that's the deal. You get your check. We're just here to give you an update of what's happening. Okay. When they don't want your check. <laughs> when they but when do they propose to break ground on this project? You don't know. Once they buy it, I mean they're going to buy it. You know what I mean? They, They've already done it. the due they're diligence, so. And, and they should get their permits. And, and they love everything about the property. The only thing they do have to do is they have to get one piece rezoned, okay? But they, it's a technicality, okay? But they're willing to buy it. That's, that's what they're doing. And in buying it, I'm paying you, right, the million two, okay? And uh, it's a deal. But that's not what the deal was. That's the only thing. That's not what the PNS says, Peter. Well, it, it, you know, I don't know, Peter. That's, that's why I brought him along. I, I, I know. Yeah. And we can have two other attorneys that'll say something else, and we You're can right. have another yeah, fifth attorney to say something different. You know the game. Yeah. I, I don't. I'm, I wouldn't even get involved with that. All I know is I have a bona fide buyer, which, you know, they're from uh, Tennessee. I, I believe it's Tennessee. Or yeah. Chattanooga. They're a multi-billion dollar company, okay, and they want to build a shopping center in Uxbridge, which will bring a lot of revenue. And that's okay. what the town wanted, if I'm not the mistaken. The town wanted. This was the Their plan. town vote. And the first gentleman that was handling this, okay, apparently, you know, <clears throat> this happened, that happened, and, it, you know, it just didn't go together. And Tracy here, you know, who's assistant to me, went out and she found these people. And these people have been very active. We've, been, we've met with the, uh, she's met with Jill before. She's met with the town planner. You know, she, we brought them in. Uh, did you bring them into? Yes. The, she brought them in to have a meeting, you know. Most recently with the town manager, with Mark Mancuso. And everything. So this is a, this is a buy. Now, do you want my check for a million two? And well, that's what you got You know, frankly, the prospects of a million two frightens me because it's gonna get swallowed up in the operating budgets and it's gonna right. create a new baseline that we can't afford to sustain. You're right. Well, I mean, that's a, okay, hold on. Unless my memory is fading quickly, it seems to me in my recent memory, there were many multi-billion dollar companies a week ago who today are no dollar companies. So I'm not overly impressed with big I companies. Understand. And I appreciate your conversations with the developer and the planner and the schmanner, but none of that is the deal. But you still get your money. It doesn't matter about that. No, no, no. It wasn't a question of money. It was more to it than the money. Okay. Now, as you know, I have never been in favor of a stupid shopping center, but the deal is the deal. And the deal was the closing takes place by a certain date when all the permits, necessary to build a 500,000 square foot shopping center is in hand. That was the thing that was offered to the town. The PNS was 
drafted pursuant to the response to the request for proposals. Okay, so I guess the question is, is the town of Uxbridge, if that's the case between now and September 29th, is the town going to make itself available to expedite that permitting process? Well, do you, if Mr. Casino or somebody else can come through and present all the permits necessary, all the, quote, public and private permits necessary to build a 500 thousand square foot shopping center on that property, then they've met the conditions of the PNS. If they haven't done that, they have not met the conditions of the PNS. That's why when the further payment was, was tended, remember I asked that we let them know specifically that this is for, this is we forfeited if all the conditions of the PNS were not met. Keep in mind, nothing has been done. And in, in the PNS is very specific, the request for proposals. Time is of the essence. Expedited. You need to work diligently to secure all the permits necessary, so on and so forth. And the latest word we received from our planner developer was that nothing has been done. There are no applications. The brochures are pretty. I like those brochures. They're nice colors. But they are, in fact, just brochures. The, the, uh, the Sherry is and, and his friends, they gave us pretty brochures, too. I remember them. Very nice. Mr. Chairman, can I just be here? We want to close. Um, I'm not going to debate it with you. We obviously have different opinions. He's got the money. He's prepared to close at the end of the month. I at least need word from your council whether or not the town intends to perform. If you don't intend to perform, you know, he's got, he's got to take action, whatever he Well, the question is rather not, I, are we I, ready to perform? It's the question of whether no. the other no, party. No, no, well, that, that's, that's what the difference of opinion right, is. Right, exactly. You know, and and, and, and I agree. And, and, Let's get it from council. Ask the question. I need, I need to know one way or the other, so how I'm going to perform. Yeah, that's yeah, fair. If you're not, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Today is what, the 22nd, right? Mm -hmm. So deadline, it w would be next Tuesday, it would be the 29th. 29th, that would be Monday, right? I'm sorry? That would be Monday. Oh, you're right. All right. Um. A million two swallowed up in the operating budgets will kill I, us in the operating years if we don't have any revenue coming in. No, there. that's our responsibility no, not to uh, no, it isn't. to protect town, that town, money. The town meeting will go in and they'll spend it willy-nilly with absolutely no sense of responsibility. Well, then that's the, key, then that's the citizen's the choice if they want to blow that money. It's no, our job to try to educate them to prevent them from doing that. We don't want the money. But, we want a project there. We want to continue, right. but we have a project on the table here. He no, you don't. You don't. You have a brochure, Carrie. You have a brochure. I've got a drawer full of brochures. Everybody who comes to see me has brochures. Well, then we're back to the point of the deed. We can, we can approach Mr. Ticino. Ticino, thank you, and you know, ask him if he's willing to take stipulations on the deed since according to members of the board there are issues regarding Carrie, I had some preliminary uh, discussions with Pat Costello and you know, we'll take a deed subject to X to an XY yeah, you want a shopping we're, center. we're building a shopping no center. Problem at all. so if the deal falls off the table then they have a deed that's aligned to exactly what they told us they were going to do right. and they still have the land and we don't but what do we with the deal for 10 years in this economy well, the, the town owning the land and not Mary, getting any tax revenue from Mary, it is a whole different issue also. I don't buckle under pressure. A million two is death for this town without any guaranteed revenue to come in to support spending an extra million two in this fiscal year. Keep in mind, you know, it's never been proven any place, but I'm supposed to be your partner. So this I understand that. You bring me a guy 
And I say, I don't want to sell it. I absolutely I mean, that's agree. what you're doing here. You know? Now, I'm, you want to say I'm your partner? I'm your partner, people. You know? Which has never been proven, never been taken to Superior Court. Okay? Now, we know that, and, and Peter knows, though. You know, Peter's pretty good. He knows. I don't know anything. I'm just I a farmer. You forgot. You, you, get, you know, I need you. But let me tell you a story now. This is the thing. I'm your partner. Let's say we're partners. So you say to me right now, no, 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 we're not going to take your money. We're going to say fight this in court. So I say, okay, we'll do what you got to do. Then you've got a power plant that comes down the street or whoever. So we want to buy that property. Then I sit down and say, guess what, people? No. I don't want to sell it to you. Where are we? That's the situation. No, the situation you want to say you're my partner? We made a deal. The, same the, the deal was that the permitting process was supposed to have been ongoing and completed. That you have to talk to your, see, your attorney don't believe that, but you have to talk to him. He, 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 that's what these guys get paid for. I don't get paid for that. I don't know, I, I'll tell you. How I look at that and how I read that, it says that if I wanted to buy it, even if there's not, I could buy it. It's like you, you can't give me a deed. Did you know that? You can't give me a deed. No way you can give me a deed. You can give me a piece of paper saying, if the town of Uxbridge has any interest in it, we're going to sell it to you for a million two. But we really don't own it, because we don't have a deed. And we can't get a deed. But we're going to sell you our interest. So here I am saying, excuse me? We're buying your interest? What's that mean? But I'm willing to do that. But all you can do is sell me your interest. There's no way you can give me a deed. That's what the so, purchase and sales agreement says. It's a sale of the town's interest in the right. property. Absolutely if true. Can, if they can't give a deed. You're not reading it off here now. Come on. I know you read that. So there's not clear title? Huh? So the, the, the land? We, we, uh, <laughs> no, I, we I, have a 50% undivided interest in the land with Mr. Ticino. That That's not uncommon. Here. That's not uncommon at all. It is very uncommon. Every estate ever taken or anything has to be taken in the entirety. <coughs> it's never been taken to the Superior Court because I think you people deserve some money. I think you people deserve some money. And that's why I'm here. And that's why this whole thing started this way, okay? I think the town should get something out of this deal. And that's what I'm trying to do. It's up to what you people want. I don't care one way or the other. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, like I, like I said, I just encourage you, if you could speak with Patrick, uh, let me know what direction you're going in. I think there's resolutions. There's plenty of ways to resolve this. You can do it with deed restrictions. Uh, those restrictions are good for 30 years. Um, so he's going to be stuck building a shopping mall regardless. So hopefully we can That's not what we're looking for, but I agree. I agree with what you're saying. That's not, we, not what you're looking for. I think. Uh, yeah. Most of the rest of the board is in favor. I think we can work it out. No, no, no. I, I don't think the board's looking for land vacant for 30 oh, years. Oh, no, no, okay. I thought that's you meant, what I meant. No, no, no. mall versus no. Like industrial or whatever. But, uh, if I could just hear from Patrick, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, the, what I'd like to do is, is, is talk to the board. Um, we have a work session scheduled, right? Tomorrow. 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 Um, perhaps if we can have Pat available. We can. It's no, not on we can't. the agenda. Yeah, it's not on the agenda. Okay. But, but, we could try to have a conference call or something like that with, with Pat uh, prior to next Monday, if, if that makes sense to, to do. We can call a special meeting for later this week. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, I want to thank yes. you very can much. Can I thank you for your time? Yes. Yeah, we are partners, if you want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Peter, do you want the brochure? No, thank you. I had you. it up there. <laughs> you put it in the drawer with the rest of your brochures? No, they go uh, somewhere else. Recycle. I don't recycle those things. I think they're glossy and recycle them. Really. Oh, they do. They do. Right, uh, next item on the agenda is update on economic development slash non-residential development projects from the Director of Planning and Economic Development, Megan Dupree. Good evening. Uh, I know that there was a specific question that was put forth that you had asked me to come and address 
um, in particular are two questions. Uh, the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy dated the 13th of August. There's nothing new, Uxbridge. Why is there nothing new for Uxbridge is the question. There were, yes, you raised two questions, Mike. The Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy is a compilation of existing, by definition, it is a compilation of existing and known proposed development projects. The 2008 update actually did not include most of the Uxbridge projects that are listed there. By working with Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, which is the agency charged with developing the SEDs and the annual updates, uh, we were able to make the case for regional impacts of these projects. The value of being included or having a project included on the SEDs um, is twofold. It could be useful to the community in pursuing grant funds or development programs if that's what the community is doing. But even more importantly, I think, is that projects that are listed in the SEDs um, are themselves eligible for development incentives, whether or not through the local government, uh, through federal and state programs as well. So with projects that we know are ongoing that certainly have regional impacts, it was important to make sure that they're included in the SEDs update. This was an annual update. It was not intended to be the five-year revision. I believe that's coming up next fiscal year. Um, why they had been previously absent from that, I don't know. I don't know how involved the previous uh, director of planning and economic development was in the formulation of that material or, or participation with Central Mass Regional Planning, but it's certainly on our radar screen here. Well, the issue for me, the town manager, when she did her last reorganization, insisted that your primary focus would be economic development. And here it is a year later and you've brought nothing new to the table. Well, uh, there are a number of different responses to that. I'm certainly prepared to review some of the key issues that I have been involved with over the past year or 13 months. Um, I certainly also meet with my supervisor regularly to do reality checks on where my time is going and what the expectations are and what needs to be adjusted if necessary. Um, to the point of economic development activity, as I say, having projects on the radar screen is helpful certainly for the individual proponents. Those proponents, uh, the project developers, aren't just sort of out there, I have regular communication with them. There was some reference just made um, by Mr. Ticino's team that there had been periodic meetings and in fact I have regular meetings and most of those you are aware of with Mr. Ticino's crew. I also meet regularly in some way, shape or form with the developers identified um, or working on proposals for the 200 acres on the southwest side of the intersection of 16 and 146. Part of that was rezoned for a total of 200 acres zone industrial. That includes some of the uh, rest area locations on 146 and uh, I meet regularly or converse with the folks who are developing a project on that site. I meet regularly with the developer of Burnett Mill, with the developers of Stanley <coughs> Wollen, and with uh, Wakantuck Mill. Some of the projects that are coming up before town meeting, for example, the rezoning that was referenced by Mr. Ticino's uh, team here, there was a discussion put forth of whether they should coordinate with the Board of Selectmen how they would like to proceed with their economic development and rezoning um, components. So there's regular outreach with the key economic development partners in the community. We've also been developing uh, a newsletter that would be available electronically and I'm hoping that the final draft was given to the town manager today uh, and that is intended to promote economic development. The first issue would be general again acquainted with the community but as we work with some of the other products that we have in the pipelines we'll include demographic information and updated census material so that it can be an active marketing tool for potential developers in the town. We have some ongoing projects that continue to go through some fits and starts. For example, the economic development strategy being developed as part of our uh, grant through the 43D program, that's a little over $100,000, was 
expected several months ago. There's been a number of, um, there have been a number of challenges with that product. In particular, the data sets through our assessor's office don't, don't geographically close, or don't mathematically close. So some of the analyses that was anticipated to go rather easily has been delayed. Interestingly, this kind of trickles down to impact the effort to update our zoning map. Right now we have what looks like a computer generated depiction of our zoning map. It's actually sort of a CAD zoning map, but it's not a mathematically drawn zoning map. And there are a number of issues that need to be investigated once we get our baseline data um, in more usable form. And I've been working with the assessor's office on that. Dave Utakis is our GIS guru, such as it is here in the town. We've increased the amount of material on our website so that it's readily available to folks, certainly developing a great deal of the material and updating our regulations and getting the information in a logical and usable format makes it more um, appealing for a development company. It's typical to say if you've got a zoning question, you don't need to contact me. It's, it's available on the web. You can do some checking around, compare it with other towns. But oh, by the way, what can we do to help you? What are you looking for? There have been a couple of, uh, actually I can think of three individual proposals that could have come to Fall Town Meeting in anticipation of potential development. It's not apparently ripe yet, but again, I work regularly with potential developers in town. This is obviously in addition to the residential development and the kind of planning board administrative reviews. Uh, we're certainly continuing to work on cleaning up a number of items there, but I'm talking primarily about non-residential development, what people might term economic development. We have a technical review committee that I developed. It's available uh, to meet on an interdepartmental level for any applicants that are before the town, but it's also available to meet with anyone who wishes to come before the town so that even in an informal level with multiple departments present, you can identify areas of concern that may or may not result or areas of opportunity that may exist. And this is a standing committee. Uh, this has been publicized. Again, the information is on the website. It's scheduled to meet twice a month. We meet more or less frequently as needed. Uh, let's see, best uh, streamlined permitting practices. The state has 26 best management practices that communities are supposed to strive toward. Uh, more than a dozen have been put into some stage of implementation in the year that I've been here. Two existed prior to my arrival. I would like to complete, I'm intending to complete those 12 that are in various stages of implementation and recommend implementation of several others, not all of them. It's been my suggestion through previous correspondence to the town manager that a number do not apply to this community. But again, the town is participating in developing best management practices and making that information widely available. We're a border community, so when I interact with chambers of commerce, I do so in both states. Um, Mike Peterson and I go back a number of years. Mike Peterson, who introduced the National Grid Project, he and I met each other probably a decade ago working on the Economic Development Committee, which then existed with the Blackstone Valley Chamber of Commerce. We've maintained interaction. Each of us actually served a good stint on the board of directors for the Blackstone Valley Chamber. We've also been continuing to work with our 418 plan and renewing the goals that are identified in that plan. It was not necessary to hire a consultant for this. Doing so, again, helps to lay the groundwork for additional analyses that may come out of uh, the comprehensive economic development strategy that's being developed. I know another question, Mike, was about the participation of the town in the growth districts initiative. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that's on the um, range of possibilities as we continue to get our ground data together. Our master plan is some 35, 40 years old, 45 years old. <clears throat> we have some planning studies that have been conducted and put on a shelf. There has not been a consistent, current, maintained master planning effort by this town in 45 years. There have been a number of great projects. And as I continue to go through 
files from the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, frankly, I'm impressed with the variety and depth of some of the projects. Not all of them were great, uh, but there have been some very solid planning studies. Unfortunately, not linked together, not with consistency, not with common purpose, not with a cross-reference or comparison to each other to see if we're straying or diverging, whether we're on one path. Part of the Growth, Dist Growth Districts Initiative will benefit from the project that the selectmen of the communities have been in, involved with, with the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the Regional Planning Commission. The selectmen are charged with, in this project, this joint chamber and CMRPC project, of helping to identify, in the absence of other documents, those targeted areas where development ought to occur. Now, as part of that process, I went through the, the plans and documents that did exist and provided that information, as well as worked with DPW to identify the infrastructure that's available. So there's a tremendous amount of activity going on, and, and I was not around when the reorganization was being discussed. I do know that the position is not a new position. The Director of Planning and Economic Development has been around for some four or five years, I guess, before my coming here. Uh, I do know that as a result of the reorganization, there are also a number of policy and personnel issues that are being tackled as well. Again, to get uh, pretty good starting points so that we have an organization that makes sense, policies that are transparent, that promote government openness and accountability and responsibility, so that as things evolve, as we do a plan, as we spend either our own town money or state money to do some project, it ties together with purpose and with reliability. I guess my, my usual refrain is crafting plans and creating processes that don't have practical, measurable outputs is not particularly realistic. Uh, but you mentioned in passing Stanley. What's he up to out there at the Stanley Woolen Mill? Uh, a couple of different ways to address that. And, and well, let, me, actually, let me tell you where I'm coming from. On the second floor, and I think on parts of the third floor, the windows are still out. We've had torrential rains recently. Water and wood frame structures do not go together well. Does this guy know what he's doing? I mean, why, 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 is, there no, the no, no, why is there no plastic on these openings? If it was my place, it sure, there sure would be. It would be tight to the weather. This has been the quick redevelopment project that started 12 years ago. Um, I agree with you. Plans should have measurable outputs, and whether it's a comprehensive master plan or whether it's a redevelopment or, or building permit plan, house plan. Um, and most of the plans do have measurable outputs. Again, it comes down to whether they stay on a shelf or are actively used and maintain focus. If our policies ought to change, then we should change the policies. Problem, and it's typical of communities, but um, has certainly been exacerbated with the lack of kind of focus planning here. But it's typical. We do this project, and oh man, that's great. Maybe we get one or two um, activities as a result. There's some public interest generated. But day to day gets in the way. Life gets in the way. Business gets in the way. It takes focus to keep those projects active and to keep our goals in mind and to maintain, again, consistency. On Stanley Woolen, he's been working to replace some windows against the recommendations of the previous building inspector because he was doing so just with the glazing and the, the windows, not with any attention to our factors or other engineering considerations in the building or potential use categories. So we don't have a code review for the project, they are in their um, development permitting phase, and that special permit process calls for very broad, open-ended categories of potential development. I frankly think that's a great way to do it. It's sort of a master plan of a site, so that in marketing the site, the owner has some flexibility for user, for end user um, individuals as well as types. Certainly, this economy is going to require flexibility, but uh, why it's not tight to the weather is beyond me. 
Will the building still be standing when he gets around to inviting that tenants? That is a huge in? concern. It is one of the very few still remaining in the state, and it's a real travesty right now. Yeah, I was hoping that um, maybe at some point, whether it's tonight or in a future discussion, is to, to let me again and myself know what type of economic development is your preference. I'm pretty happy there's a Dunkin' Donuts in downtown and the Hannaford's was remodeled and refurbished, but I'm not sure that's the priority of the board when we're looking at what's to measure of economic development. So whether it's tonight, if we want to have another workshop meeting with Megan, I know, you know we talk a lot about planning, strategic plans, master plans, but is there a certain targeted group that you want us to really market our resources to? Well, I, I guess the more fundamental question is, I mean, I, I've heard commentary about meeting with developers that have approached us and wanted to do this, that, or the other thing, but you know, I, I'd like to see us get out in front of this and, and, and be more more proactive. You know, and and maybe you are, um, but for example, the the, you know, the IDC I think is still you know in a dormant phase, and you know, and, and part of the issue has been you know lack of volunteers and lack of supportive funding even for marketing materials and, and those types of things for, for an IDC. Um, you know, have you been meeting with? The Oxbridge Business Association. I, mean, I know, you know, they they had kind of like a hiatus where where they were not meeting with the town manager on a regular basis. But are you getting to know all the members of the UBA because those are successful business people who are networked with other successful business people? And so a, a way to get the word out that Oxbridge is open for business is to get to know as many of them as possible. I mean, so so you know, I I would hope that that you're doing everything possible to be it proactive, you know, and, you know, say, hey, you know, we're open for business, come on. I mean, if you, if you go to, I think it's the, the Oxford website, they, you know, the picture of a, and there's actually a sign in town that says, you know, Oxford is open for business kind of thing. And, and if you drive through Oxford, there's a fair amount of, of you know, light industrial and, that, you know, somewhat analogous to South Oxbridge here, but. Resurrection of the IDC or an EDC is on my radar screen. It's, it's in my opinion, a little premature because we're still developing some of the groundwork. There should be a product, there should be some objectives for a committee to be able to pursue, and a product and some information for a committee to be able to market. We're very close to getting that, but we've got to walk before we can run. It's tempting to go here and go there because we've got some easy targets. That doesn't mean that they'll be successful unless we line up the material to allow them to be successful. It's absolutely on my radar screen. I carry it on every to-do list because it's there when it's time, that would be an effective tool, at least I presume so. It's certainly an important one visibly. Um, I think you heard from somebody earlier tonight that I have been meeting with the uh, Uxbridge Business Association regularly, and although um, the, the association itself took a bit of a hiatus meeting over the summer, in fact, I was present at the last meeting before summer break, I've contacted some of the board members and said, Okay, folks, let's reestablish our meeting schedule on the government, government liaison committee. Uh, been working with them, continuing on efforts to investigate the potential to get South Grafton, I'm sorry, South Oxbridge served with public water. And the, uh, I'm sorry, I was mixing up the thought of some graft in the uh, <laughs> discussions there because there's been plenty of it. But uh, I've, before their summer break, I developed a quick talking sheet with some of the considerations for doing so. We missed a great opportunity with the provision of BJ's um, just a few years ago. I was not here at the time, so I'm sure that there were factors involved from where I sit. Coming in late, Monday morning quarterbacking such as it is, um, it seemed that that was a terrific opportunity. But now there's some new attention to the idea of getting municipal infrastructure. And so we've, you know, I, I've done some preliminary groundwork and I know that uh, the group is investigating that further. Um, let's see. You know, there's, there's a litany of activity. It's every day. Um, whether I'm answering phone calls or making phone calls, developing a newsletter to go out, meeting with Chamber of Commerce or marketing officials, we don't have a team, we don't have a budget, we don't have the ability, to, as Joe DeLiso was indicating, to uh, put people up for a couple of days in a neat hotel and take them around and entertain them. However, I am meeting regularly with some of the key players in terms of property ownership, property marketing, and potential developers. And that's where having some 
regular and consistent outreach is going to be successful for us. Redeveloping our zoning bylaws was a huge boon as far as the development community was concerned. I know you don't like it. Um, but the fact is, getting our development regulations out of the 50s and into the 21st century will help with development and already is. The fact is that when people are calling wondering about this use or that use, we can turn to the zoning bylaws and have an answer. The zoning bylaws provide a job description for the zoning board. Bruce is a former member, obviously was involved in submitting that revision. It's a job description for the planning board in evaluating applications as well. There are other regulations. The subdivision, subdivision regulations are um, not new, but they're not on the highest, you know, they're not on the front burner. We meet with, um, I meet with developers who are speaking with a variety of different industry activities, whether it's um, manufacturing or educational or retail or medical. There's a whole array of activities that I'm involved with. You know, I don't report out every phone call. I don't report out every communication. When we have something solid or going, then there will be some um, information brought forth and shared. When those developers are ready to, obviously, that would be more their bailiwick. But you, you make the point that on one hand you're talking to property owners, on the other hand you're talking about interested parties. Uh, we've been briefed a couple of times in a different format on the concept of being proactive in the sense of doing the anticipatory uh, zoning activity, doing on an anticipatory basis the planning activity so that you work on the one hand with the property owner to get things lined up and then you go to that prospective uh, investor to say look at what we've got for you, come on in and set up shop. And that's what we're not seeing. Yeah, I mean, I uh, to expand on what you're saying, I mean, I, I have a concern. You stated that there were three potential um, people or entities that you've been working with that may have been ready for town meeting. Um, I mean, I know I'm no, new to the board. However, I mean, I would ask members who are currently on the board, do you have any idea who these three people are? What property are they pursuing? Uh, which area are we talking about? Is this industrial or is this a baseline business? Um, how does that tie into the property at 16 and 146? You mentioned the 200 acres, a property that's running down 146. Um, I personally haven't heard your take on the Ticino property. How if we're having a development going down 146 with 200 acres, how is that going to impact a big retail location at the corner of 146 and 16? Um, I guess what I'm saying is I'm concerned that you may have this information, but there is no teamwork occurring here. When, are, when is this board who is in the process of maybe or maybe not selling a a piece of prime real estate that's adjacent to another piece of real estate that is in some form of a phase that we haven't even been briefed on and could we be doing something that could be detrimental to another 200 acre development um, that is in process going down 146. You follow? Yes, I mean, yes and no. If I could try to capture some of that. Some of this information has been conveyed to the Board of Selectmen because it's been timely. So, for example, in the discussion of 200 acres, there's some material that's on the web through a potential developer, and this has been provided to the Board of Selectmen, not in days or weeks, but several months ago. This is not a, a quick activity. You know, when I was in the development management business, it's years and years to identify potential property, identify what you want to do there, or vice versa, depending on where you're coming at it from, developing your pro formas, even before you talk to the town, now as you talk to the town, you almost totally redevelop your pro formas. So there are various processes, but 200 acres, kind of on the diagonal corner of the PDS site, if you will, um, was fairly thoroughly vetted out in correspondence a number of months ago. 
I said that there are several developers who may have come to town meeting and part of my discussions with them has been whether it's appropriate to approach the Board of Selectmen and either investigate a partnership of activity or inform the Board of their own activity. Now, for a number of reasons, many of which I don't know, probably most of which I don't know, they're not here tonight. Um, I'm sorry, they're not here on the warrant for the town meeting coming up. The town manager mentioned the opportunity for this board to identify perhaps some key development sites or objectives. It might also be helpful, certainly as a staff person who reports to the town manager, if there is some perhaps um, vetting of what types of information and reporting you would like to have provided to you and on what level, and perhaps that can be coordinated through um, the monthly reports or some other mechanism. But quite frankly, if I'm not sure what you're looking for or whether I can deliver it, then it's difficult for me to be asked to come here and say, well, gee, this is what I do with my day or, or this is what I'm not doing with my day. It's a little bit awkward not, not, for sh not knowing for sure what your expectations are as a body, not to mention the individual expectations. The, the functioning atmosphere for me has to be as the body of the Board of Selectmen. I, I guess what I'm, and my point in the questioning is, you know, I believe that the, as you mentioned, the direction of the town and the teamwork is important. And I guess what, for instance, on the Ticino property, I mean, you, you, I don't know how much more information you have besides we, besides what we have on that situation, but I guess what I'm asking you, is there something that we're not taking into account from what you have heard of our meetings and our consideration? Is there something we're leaving out that is going to adversely um, affect the process that we are on? Are we on the right path with that, given what you see as the dynamics of everything else that's going on in town? Are we going to be heavily weighted in retail, or are we going to be heavily weighted in industry, or is there going to be some type of conflicting information here? Um, you know, I, I mean, I just bring up the 200 acres and the 146. I mean, I've heard, I have some, a little bit of understanding what's going on there, but as to how close those two properties come within mileage of each other? Are there traffic studies that you know, could be impacted? Is there something coming down the road from um, Mass Highway that we're not taking to, into account regarding these factors? I guess that's what I'm looking to. You're dealing with a lot more than we are on a daily basis. And I, and through the town manager, I mean, if you have information, um, that you feel is important to us, I guess I need to know that you'll step up and say, hey guys, did you forget about this sitting over here? On a you daily what basis, I'm I am dealing with um, these issues and both um, from a, a 30,000 foot level more so and from the weed level more so, both. Um, but the kind of information you're looking for, I think, has probably already been provided because when it matters, that's what happens. Right, just because it was provided though before, you know, when we're in a situation, just to, you know, just to remind that, does it still have a relevance? For because reality, it was given to somebody six months ago, doesn't mean that they completely remember it when they're looking at the current fraction. Well, for a reality fraction. check on the current priority development site, there is a purchase and sale agreement that was developed before my time. The priority development site was designated, again, before my time, but that doesn't matter. It's valid for a number of years. The requirement is that sites under priority development site, and this is right out of the statute, are basically promising to provide more than 50,000 square feet of generally retail <coughs> or commercial activity, uh, some job producing capability. Uh, it's not, it could be, it could have a residential component. This does not. The focus of the Oxbridge PDS was to have a retail facility, a small shopping center, and sorry, I'll use the term small. Uh, the estimates are 400,000, maybe 500,000 square feet. I think the PNS reference is up to 500,000 square feet in actual use of the property. Um, from experience, I tend to factor it down a bit. Um, so that's been the focus, the goal. 
there will be traffic studies required for that as well as for other projects nearby. And at the time any traffic study is made, standard procedure is to evaluate any other projects on the board. Um, generally, that absolutely includes projects that are in the permitting or development phase. It may also include projects that aren't formally in the process but are anticipated to be in the process, so long as you can scope out what they are because out of the, um, nobody from Andrews or Heritage is here, I'm guessing 800 or so land use codes, you need to know what those potential land use codes are, whether it's specialty retail, boutique, general retail, big box retail, commercial retail, and a number of different retail categories so that you can anticipate what trip generations will be and time periods of the day when those trips would operate. So those are some of the planning dynamics or engineering dynamics, depending on where you're coming from, just for traffic studies. When there's a project that comes in, they do a traffic study, they do an evaluation of sites in the area as well. And the market study um, or the site evaluation study varies depending on location and proposal. Well, a lot of this comes, oh, excuse me, comes, you know, comes under the planning board, but what Megan's going to look to see is, okay, there's a potential development here, there's our priority development site. Do we have the capacity for water and sewer? So that's what she's going to keep in mind through the dialogues with our, our you know, various department heads and her development review team. So that there might not be a visual um, cheerleading squad to demonstrate teamwork doesn't mean that it doesn't occur. There's a lot of behind the scene efforts. Um, there hasn't been much activity since the, the new board's been elected uh, and anything really to report on that other site. A lot of information that Megan gets and, and when I get it too, it's like, well, it's a do not disclose, don't say anything. So Megan has to, in her mind, say, okay, how do I balance traffic studies, water capacity, What's, and then I think, what's the role of the Board of Selectmen? Are we going to need a zoning change? Are we need to be concerned about capacity? But a lot of this is going to come through her review with the planning board, the special permit or whatever development that comes in. So I'm trying to balance what See, you the, need to know. The, the, the questions you're asking, Carrie, are, are absolutely valid. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a living, breathing master plan. And, and a lot of those types of things, how do all these pieces of the puzzle fit together, are addressed by that. So in, in lieu of a viable master plan that's not sitting on a shelf gathering dust, you know, it, the only way these things can get done is you know, through collaboration between boards, that kind of thing. Right. I, I guess the fundamental question, though, is what level th does this board need to be informed of potential opportunities, how early in the cycle, and in what form so that we don't uh, violate any you know, non-disclosure agreements or, or anything like that? Right. And, that, and that's what we need to grapple with. Right. Is, is, and, right. that, and that's why I kind of bring this up. And especially, I mean, we have the, this casino thing on the, you know, and she's talking about a lot of the way that the property's been, you know, already zoned. Um, you know, if, because the permits have not been attained as of to date, um, you know, that's why I threw out the option of the deed restriction so that they, you know, they are limited, so they can't come back and try to change the zoning on the property at a later date because then that would affect other factors that are involved. I guess I'm looking for direction on, you know, how easy is it to, after the fact, if this CBL fell off the table for whatever reason because they're only providing a letter of intent, um, how easy would it for them to come back around and change the zoning on that area? when, you know? Well, that's a great question. Right now, under the guidelines from um, the permitting board, whatever their name is in Boston, um, town meeting created the priority development site, and uh, that comes with it all sorts of opportunities for development permitting, but also constraints. It's job-related. It's not strictly um, get, your, get your housing folks, come and get it. Um, I'm, I'm qualifying my statement because currently, under the guidelines established by the permitting board, town meeting would need to undo that designation in order for development to proceed within that designated five-year time period from the date of adoption, unless it was consistent with the guidelines of the PDS and the 43D program. Now, uh, I believe it was Joe DeLiso who mentioned that the 43D grants, although he was using another 
um, frame of reference, but the 43D grant started out at $150,000 and now they're down to $100,000 eligibility. That's not true as of last week or the week before. That changed by the permitting board to $60,000. So the permitting board is making some changes to the guidelines. I don't know of any changes that affect sort of the undoing of the PDS designation. It's also very early in the process and I wouldn't expect that that's been encountered by the permitting board. Um, I would also expect that future guidelines on that topic will not be straightforward and easy. So I would expect that development that occurs on the PDS, on the priority development site, will need to be consistent with the um, non-residential development objectives which garnered the priority development designation to begin with. But did you to take say? advantage of those provisions. But that doesn't preclude the property owner from proceeding with doing anything that's allowable by zoning Right. Because the, the priority and development and the accelerated permitting is something you are eligible to do if you meet certain conditions. Right now. But you don't have to do that. That's not true. Okay. Right now, what I was trying to say is that that is precluded. Because in the priority development site application, the property owner is a party to that application and basically swears and affirms that they'll uphold those regulations. The town has received the grant funds, so there's a whole lot of undoing that needs to occur if we're going to undo the ultimate development. But if the town were no just, longer the owner, then that wouldn't apply. But didn't you just say that the priority development site designation has a five-year useful life? The so CBL can, can sit on that land for another two years and then do what it wants? The with designation it? is valid out of the box for five years. Five and years. as I said, the concept of somebody reneging on the, on the topic has not been approach yet hasn't been tied, uh, tested. We're nowhere near the five years. The state has not encountered it. The state has not even set up we're, guidelines we're, for their own expedited permitting under the project. We, we, we put this in place Six. two years ago? It's May of oh. Oh, So we've seven? got three years to Year go. 18, mo 18 months. Right? Okay, 18 yeah. months. So they, they can sit on the property for three and a half years, three and, a half years and then do whatever they want with it. Well, I don't, I don't want to make assumptions or Suppositions like that, it feels a little bit careless not to yeah. know for sure with that specific question. Somebody would have to show me posed. something that ties this to the land. Because what she's talking about is true insofar as the town of Uxbridge is an owner of the property or any owner is wants to do this under those guidelines. Yeah. But the, the priority development site agreement was between the town of Uxbridge yeah. and Cherrier. And Ticino. Yes. And Ticino as well. Well, yeah. Ticino wasn't there at the beginning, was But he's he? still, he's an owner. It's a current ownership. Of but under owner. this new deal, he won't be anymore. And neither will the town of Uxbridge. And neither will, neither is Sherry now. No, but he will because he is still a party to it until the property is sold to CBL, which won't occur until they've completed the permitting process and broken ground. Yes, but so they, 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 are, they are denying that that tie. I don't agree with them, but they are denying that tie. Denying what That's tie? The There's tie between, according to Ticino, the, the notion that they have to have all these permits is not binding on him. It was just a convenience It's for binding them. on the buyer. According to him, no. I agree with you, but they have a different view. But on the broader subject that, that, that Mike raised, let me come to Megan's defense, because I think what you're asking of her is not something that she or anyone like her can possibly do. There are two parallel universes. You know about parallel universes? Okay. One universe consists of Megan and planning boards and regional development people, and they exist over here. There's another parallel and completely independent universe of real people owning real land doing real things. In Uxbridge. In, this, in anywhere. <laughs> and the space between them, the, you know, light doesn't travel from one to the other. Information doesn't travel from one to another. The fact is that every master plan in the country sits on a shelf. They sit on a shelf. That's the nature of it. That's how it is. And if you are interested in promoting business or industry, the best thing a town can do is to have clear laws that people can pick up and read and say, okay, 
these are the things I can do in this area, and these are the things I can do in this area, and so forth. That's it. It doesn't take thousands of dollars, it doesn't take a big staff, it doesn't take new organizations, it doesn't take a master plan. But by definition, towns like any organ organism are growing, evolving things, and they always change. A master plan is made up, if you look at the state regulations regarding master plans, it really talks about the government structures. And a master plan is supposed to have a housing element, where we're supposed to provide housing for all segments of the population. So we have to have a plan, supposed to have a plan, for single family areas and multiple family areas and, and so forth, and industrial. And the, we're supposed to make sure that we have a plan for the things under our control, our public services, the roads, the water and sewer and so forth. That's what it is. The master plan is not a, a brochure to attract business. It is additionally, though, a guide for decision making by the Board of Selectmen, by the Planning Board, even by town meeting. So a master plan that I can design for making a decision as to we want Mr. Desolate's company or Mr. Potaski's company. You see, towns are not country clubs. We don't have a membership committee where we can decide, okay, who wants to apply for membership. That's not how it works. And people in government want it to be that way. I'd like it to be that way, too, as long as I were chairman of the membership committee. But we can't do that. And we only get in trouble if we try. Right, so as the real estate development manager with um, the White Corporation, for example, one of my focuses was on looking at mill redevelopments. So as I went around to vacant mills, I had to know what the zoning allowed for redevelopment there. And that was the basis for my, my wishful pro forma, and from there, I went to uh, some of the concrete, the nut and bolts, regulatory requirements, and some of the more um, detailed provisions to help shape it down to whether it was a viable project or not. So having clear and concise zoning bylaws in particular and development permitting regulations is critical to development opportunities. A master plan would, in theory, identify the areas for industrial development, for example, identify the areas to focus for infrastructure expansion, whether that's South Oxbridge or not. Um, portions of the town are in the groundwater protection zone. Is that an area where, you, where infrastructure should be critically expanded or avoided? So there are a number of these philosophical issues that a master plan will provide, is intended to provide a guideline for decision making on whether it's decision making from outside customers or internal customers, whether it's for the planning board, the board of selectmen, or even town meeting votes. Um, but it's one component. And yes, there are communities where historically master plans sat on shelves. Outside of Massachusetts, that is rarely the situation because outside of Massachusetts, <coughs> a master plan forms the basis for every decision by any regulatory body. It's quoted chapter and verse as to how an application is supported or in concert with the master plan. It's the basis for grant funds, whether or not you want to pursue them. Massachusetts is definitely a different animal. There's no question about that. Um, but as we mature in our operations, as we create systems that will survive the individuals who are participating on any daily basis, um, whether it's a master plan or any other operating procedure, having a clear and consistent, consistent message and objectives and steps for getting there is what will facilitate economic development. It won't recruit it, it won't sell it, it will facilitate it. Mm -hmm. The economic development strategy that's being done as part of our 43D project, our priority development site activity, if you participated in the meetings that the consultant held um, several months ago, you know that it focuses on, in part, analyzing our current um, business balance in the community, as well as our revenue balances. Um, projecting for the potential based on our zoning and identifies areas where that might be brought into better balance. The zoning board has been working on um, a bylaw for the downtown that would allow mixed use development that was historically the backbone of the downtown and certainly under regulations not unusual for communities. The current development pattern is absolutely prohibited. Uh, 
uh, that's not on this fall town meeting I think warrant, what I'd like but to it's do one is, of the pieces. Is, uh, take a, the advice of the town manager. We should probably schedule an off night workshop, kind of delve into this, peel back the next couple layers of the onion um, on this, um, and maybe target a couple weeks out on that. I also, at some point, w would like to get um, your assessment as to um, the reorganization, uh, you know, because we, we, you know, significantly reorganized. Um, you know, planning, permitting, uh, inspectional services, all that. And uh, I think, you know, the board would like to get an update from you as to your assessment as to the effectiveness, you know, what's worked well, what's not worked well, and recommendations for kind of a go-forward strategy relative to, to the organization as well. And, so. and when we do that, uh, an, an update on the current state of play, is it 43T that's um, been fl floating back and forth? There's a 40 T, which is a 42. particular program, 43D is the statutory I'm talking about the one where you set up a, a district within a town and they self-tax uh, themselves for... 40T. 40T, not 43. Um, 40 and it's T. related to 40S. Yeah. Sorry, I believe R and N are also that, in know, there, but T is the key one. I, I know. I've been weighing in sort of negatively on that, as have Barbara Anderson. I know Barbara's gone a couple of times to the legislature on that one, and I've lost track of what the state of play is on, on that particular notion. The the guy from, is it Douglas or someplace that was behind it, the attorney Al, that was pushing it? Hal Davis. Davis, a yeah. Huge yeah. He, from uh, Douglas. The, the last time I saw him at one of these uh, meetings, he assured me that they were toning down the wording to um, uh, accommodate crotchety old people like myself and Barbara. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that fell off the radar screen and the new yeah, one yeah. is growth district that's, that's, initiatives that's and there'll asking. be something can, else in a year. Get an update on that one. Sure. Everything, sure. everything in Uxbridge falls off the radar screen. We can't get anything here. We just go around and around and around. And, and it's hard not to give up and jump to a different project, but success will only come from Perseverance. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Staying with it. Let's Staying target out. sometime. Uh, actually, at our next meeting uh, in October, let's target maybe a week or so after that for a workshop. It'd be about a month out, but at least for just an and off the workshop is going to be. Well, I, I, well, the things we've the, just the questions that, that, that Megan asked, for example, which we are did nothing. We spent no. an hour. And the net result is what? Tell me what it is. Nothing. We're going <laughs> to nothing. No. We're going to schedule a another workshop. hour. No. Nothing. Right. Well, the, 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 cha the challenge is, you know, if, if we're going to charge her with economic development. It, 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 it's a lost cause. She, it can't be done. I'm telling you. It can't. She can work at it. She, she's very nice. I'm sure she works very hard. It can't be done. Have faith here. Can't we try? I have a lot of faith. <laughs> I have a faith in, in understanding and knowledge and knowing forces it can't be done what we've got to do is create the wormhole to connect you to parallel universes <laughs> that's been tried <laughs> but it doesn't work the only thing you find in a wormhole are worms i had to say peter you might be the only person i know who actually says on record that i'm nice that's not my <laughs> reputation at all so i'm a little bit well, that's just weather. because you're here that's an honest discussion i can assure you Anyway, thanks, when you're not around, you don't th say thanks that. For, for putting up with my curmudgeonliness again tonight. You know, information sharing is always valuable. It may not be worth the total of an hour, but the fact that it occurs is important. Face-to-face -face is helpful. I update our development status sheets periodically. Development moves slowly, so it's not every week, it's not every month, it's every several months, and again, that's available online. I don't know what commentary just went on over here, but three people are chuckling, so I'm a little nervous. Well, we clean up the sign, welcome to Suxbridge, so um, oh. Oh. hopefully that's business friendly and we can show that we're open for well, business. Well, I don't know, it depends on what business you're trying to go. <laughs> what business? All right, I'd like to move on then. Excellent. Okay. Have a good night, all. Good Actually, thanks. I'll stick around for a few minutes if Glenn is up. Okay. Yep. Uh, inventory assessment of town-owned structures update from Inspector of Buildings, uh, Glenn Hand. And we have a report in our packets. Mm -hmm. You've met Glenn yet? No, we've not. Met. He's our new I'm inspector. Glenn Hand, Inspector of Buildings. Glenn is part-time working about um, 25 or 30 hours a week, getting paid for 19 hours a week. 
the building department is running on pretty routine types of applications right now. I think a lot of pellet stoves, but your zoning inquiries have been absolutely slamming you. Um, Glenn has been a, a building inspector in at least one other community and a local inspector in several communities. He's still available for backup in other communities. He's a full-time construction project manager. You may not have the term exactly correct, correct on your job title, but that's your activity level. A number of years in local government service, and so far as any reports I've heard, is a way with people and conveying information clearly and calmly. And if you hear differently, I'd like to know about it. But so far, I've been very impressed with Glenn's activity and getting up to speed here in the town. Okay. So I know it's been a short while. You prepared an analysis, and I'll step out. You've told him that my bark is worse than my bite. I have given him no warnings. I figured oh, okay. let him have it. Okay. Unfortunately, Glenn already knows who I am. <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, <laughs> so, so I was asked to look at a few um, issues in a few of the buildings, town buildings, and you probably have this report in front of you. Mm -hmm. We looked at North Station, and please interrupt at any moment for with questions, but. Um, Looked at North Station, I think anybody um, that's been there knows that that's probably not um, going to function well with today's equipment. I think that's, that's said and done. Um, Actually, can I interrupt just for one second before you really delve into this? Part of what uh, sparked this, uh, this project and then you coming here tonight, uh, Selectman Petaskey suggested that uh, with the limited funds available currently in the school town building maintenance account, that uh, it was appropriate to, since you know, you were new on board and everything else, to have you do an assessment of everything out there, so that you, you'd also be able to help weigh in on allocation of you know the, the funds that are available in there. So I just kind of keep that as backdrop there. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, so you know that that is was the intent, and um, to try to provide some some help and direction in some of these priorities. And um, so we looked at that that North Station, and obviously that. It's just ins insufficient, and the land's not big enough to expand. It's pretty much said and done. So th my, my suggestion was just to sort of stabilize the structure as it is and um, essentially keep the water out for now and do whatever it takes to keep the water out. S structurally, it seems okay, it's, and, and I, I'm not a structural engineer, so you know I'm looking for some serious structural problems, and if, if we saw something like that, we'd, we'd raise it right away a lot sooner than this probably, but essentially we're trying to keep the water out of the building and stabilize the structure as it is until there's a replacement. So that's, I, I don't know if there's any questions about North Station. The, the age, it was built, what, 1903, 1908? 1903, I believe 1903. it was. I mean, you know, if there was room <laughs> to expand, it would be a nice structure to, to hang on to. It's just, it's, no it's not go. gonna work for, too many uses, unfortunately. <coughs> Mike, you had some specific concerns about it. Did, he, was he covered it in here. It's, okay. If you notice that the clapboards on the bottom couple of courses are missing and it's open to the to the weather, and you yeah. comment about having to uh, replace some of the sill plates or stabilize the sill plates. Yeah, and just um, keep the weather out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't. I wasn't know. aware of the the problems with the leaking in the roof. That. Yeah. Uh, that was news to me here, but you you have a. I think there's a, a way, way of putting a barrier without com doing it completely without the replacing the roof. Yeah, I, I don't think you want to get into that. Well, if if it's got a useful life of a couple of years, you wouldn't want to put a 20-year roof on it, would you? No, no. <laughs> Is your recommendation on stabilizing it um, something that the? I mean, I'm just thinking a limited funds. Were you um, looking to hire a contractor to do this, or is this something the DPW can do? Peter's looking into it. Okay. Chief Mastrowski is looking into it to, to stabilize and get the weather out. He's going to be getting back to us with a cost estimate. Okay. Well, you know, my suggestion was Peter could get, you know, a few dollars worth of clapboards and five dollars worth of nails and go out there with his own hammer. And Have you priced lumber lately, though? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's okay. the North Station. The, the library. We looked at the library, walked around the outside, walked around the inside. There's some some obvious concerns there. And um, you know, one of the, the major concern for any building is water. 
whether it's condensation or water coming from the outside. So we looked at those things. The first thing um, we noticed and, and we talked about um, was there was some peeling paint on the inside and, and what's causing that. And we, we were just walking the site and taking in the information and from that information trying to get a direction. And, and I'm not trying to draw any, necessarily draw any conclusions where the water's coming from, but obviously there's some concerns about the, the brick pointing and there could be some water infiltration there or moisture there or weep holes are clogged and there's moisture trapped inside the cavity and ends up inside and causing the paint to peel. That's a possibility. A, a more immediate concern for me would be the torn flashing on the roof. Um, it, it was evident from the ground. I didn't go up on the roof, so maybe there's some other flashing that's been, it's been counter flashed, if you will. So that's possible, that's not a, an issue. If one way to test that would be with a roofer and a hose. And they literally just one step at a time work their way around the building. Try to find out where the water's getting in. Because there's, there's definitely water damage. Um, and, and structurally that building is, I mean it's a gorgeous building architecturally and, it's, and structurally I don't see any immediate concerns but obviously water's, water's an issue. The other area was the skylight. The skylight's not insulated glass so there's going to be condensation. It draws warm air, it condenses, freezes and then comes down inside. And there's an ornamental um, skylight, the, the stained glass skylight above the book stacks that obviously people want to protect and, and don't want damage there. So there's a couple options. People seem to like the skylight for the natural light coming through the stained glass, but you could simulate that with lighting. So if you decided, or somebody decided, the library um, trustees decided to take the skylight off, insulate it, replace that with a conventional roof and roof framing then you could simulate that, that um, natural light with lighting. It's just an idea, it's just a suggestion, but obviously the water and books, and, and, and the books have tremendous value, um, and, I, and I imagine some of them are even, could even be priceless. There's some, a lot of value in libraries. I've done a lot of work in libraries. Um, so I can appreciate the value there. Um, like I said, the brick pointing, you know, there is a concern about some of the brick pointing, especially around the chimney. You could actually see vegetation growing in there. Uh, but um, what the priorities are, I just suggested, you know, start with the skylight. If, this, if all the money you have is, you know, if you had to make a choice between the skylight and the pointing, I'd go with the skylight for now because there's definitely water coming in there um, and the flashing. But um, so those are the issues with the library. I don't know if there's any questions there. Yeah, did you see the pictures the librarian had when they changed, when they redid the room down, downstairs of the bricks and all, all the paint peeling and all that? Because it, she's got about that many pictures. I mean, she's got a lot of them. Photos? Yes, of when they redid the uh, downstairs. No, I don't think I saw that. <coughs> well, I mean, that that's good evidence of some, some yeah. other problem. And, and she, uh, uh, the, uh, Debbie Young, I don't know if you met her. She has pictures of when they fix that downstairs, and you can see all the walls and what's going on in there. You, you mean down in the basement in the children's area, or mm -hmm. when they redid mm -hmm. the first floor? Both. Children. She got pictures on both. That, yeah, so that could indicate another problem, maybe something with the downspouts, getting water away from that was a leaking them. pipe. No. A children's pipe. No. We're talking about a whole wall. And then they, walls. And they sort of renovated it and covered it, so now yeah, they covered it. I'm not sure if there's any damage there. You know, I don't... I, Again, I, but I she think, has pictures of everything. Yeah, I, that's, I'm surprised she didn't show you. We we were really we were running through this building, we were oh, practically oh, running. She didn't she didn't have a lot of time. But uh, you know that with all of this, I think it's just sort of give direction to somebody to go investigate further. Um, you know, the, the skylight's pretty obvious. No need to investigate that. You probably want to replace it. The other water damage, you you kind of have to find out where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Brick pointing, flashing. The roof looks phenomenal, it looks great. And uh, so those are the areas I'd look for. If, if there's water in the basement, I'd go right to the downspouts and see if they're getting the water away from the building. Because when, they, when I redid it, you can, you can see the pictures, there was, there's been water in there. Yeah. Now on all, and that, all, I mean, all the walls. 
that's clearly it with any building you, you gotta resolve that problem quickly um, there's no other questions the town hall we you know I spent a lot of time this is another great building phenomenal architecture and you know I, I think it's in great shape obvious accessibility issues but um, you know I wasn't addressing that specifically kind of looking at some of the more immediate concerns and the concern around the, the stage on the second floor and there's some settling there and the settling seems to be around the, at the corners of the structure of that stage structure and the, and, and the stage itself has a crown it sort of correlates with the settling on each corner so something's happening there and that would be more of a, an immediate concern but I can't tell exactly what's happening until we open the ceiling you have a tin ceiling there you have to sort of open up the structure so you can see what what's happening there but one of the first things I want to do is look at the foundation that's you know and the foundation looks fantastic I mean it, it you don't see a lot of water damage down there you don't see movement cracks you, the, the paint that's down there has been there forever and you don't see it peeling or cracking so it doesn't seem to be evidence of problems down there so you know sort of limits the scope of the issue if you will so, so to inspect Pencils. above the tin uh, ceiling, that's destructive to the ceiling, though, isn't it? In the areas that, that you would, uh, can you take down just parts never, of it? I, you know, I've never dealt with that, and I think there are contractors and that that can deal with that kind of thing. You know, you okay. find the you find the nails, you take the panels down. Whether they survive and, and look exactly like they did, probably not. Um, right. But you know, it's a challenge to do that. Um, I got the number of one contractor that you know does this kind of work in town. I think that the town needs to sort of investigate that a little bit to see who's got skill, because that, that's a particular skill that yeah. isn't okay. readily available, I don't think. Um, about going at it from the floor instead of going at it from the ceiling, would they, would they be able to see, you know, I'm just suggesting would it be easier to pull up the floor than it would to take down the ceiling? I think you'll see more from below, you know. I mean, it's it's a possibility, and, and again, you know, a contractor who does restoration with structures like this would have a better idea. Okay. You know, that that might be a fine suggestion. But the idea is to see what what is holding up the stage and and what is deflecting. I don't know how long it's been like that. Could have been years, and maybe it's not moving anymore. But when it, when we're walking around and I'm counting the distance between the columns, this way and that way. Well, and I saw some settling and cracking in the assessor's office. Seems like there might be a column that should have been there. And maybe there was some sort of structure being replaced to take the load, but I have no way of knowing, so somebody would have to open that up to look. Um, but it looks like something's happening in the assessor's office, and, uh, and that might relate to the stage, although it's kind of a far away. That's why we don't meet in the assessor's I want to, you know, looks like it's been the, 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 the cracks and that kind of thing's been happening over time. Uh, you know, no need for immediate you have concern. a guess on the library and the town hall, what it would cost to do the minimum repairs to these buildings? It, it's just, no, I don't, unfortunately. If I guess, guess it's okay. all it is is a guess, and it's not really, you know. You can't know that unless you know first what the problem is. Yeah. The problem with town hall, right? yeah. You have to you start know. taking things apart and see where the problems are. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, any potential contractor could hear a number and, you know, could be lower than that number, but once you put a number out there, you kind of mm -hmm. at a disadvantage. So I would hesitate to do that, but. I think you know the idea was to sort of prioritize and you know the, the north station is what it is and it's been that way for a long time um, the library has some issues but they've had a roofer there that knows the building and he might be able to find that water problem really quickly um, the town hall you know get a contractor in to open up the structure a little bit and find out what you're what you're up against and, and then go from there maybe we don't want to know yeah, well, <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> but because when we do and we see what it's going to cost to fix it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it might not be as bad as, you know, there's, there's ways to fix these things. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, with the, the uh, 
easiest fix of all this stuff be the skylight at, at the library? Um, I, you know, I, it's hard to define easy, but um, this, the skylight is probably an easy decision. Um, That's not a slate roof over that part of it, is it? No, it isn't. Sort of a composition. Right. So, I mean, when I, one thought I had was even to, to build a false ceiling in there and insulate it. Let the skylight be cold, keep the warm air from the skylight, no more condensation. But then you wouldn't see On a skylight. temporary basis, you wouldn't have a daylight, but you could put in a couple light fixtures in, inside that cavity and create the daylight. So that's, that's a pretty cheap fix. It's temporary. It doesn't sound very attractive, but I don't think that's wouldn't cheaper see it. than eliminating the skylight. What's that? I don't think that's cheaper than eliminating, eliminating the skylight. And that's a better fix, isn't it? Eliminating the skylight's a more permanent fix, probably more expensive. If you put a, if you put a, a false ceiling and there's a leak in the side, you're not going to be aware of it. Now you, yeah, yeah. I don't like not being it's aware It's a temporary of it. fix, yeah. But it's just a suggestion. Okay. Any other questions? Great to meet you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your help, too. Thank you. Yeah, I thank appreciate you. it. See, we're not as bad as our reputation. <laughs> this is your first meeting, though. You, you, you get a buy for the first meeting. Uh, so. Right. What, what I'd like to do is uh, jump ahead to, to new business, uh, the, the abatement request. I see uh, Mr. Christensen is in the uh, audience. We could do that. Um, that. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, we, we have uh, his uh, written abate, abatement request in our packets. I assume everyone's had a chance uh, to, to read it. Um, I would uh, certainly uh, invite Mr. Christensen uh, just to come to the podium. I, I would ask you not to, to just kind of you know, read this to us. So it's in our packet. We've read it. Yes. Uh, but if there are any you know, other substantive points that you'd like to make, you know, certainly give you the opportunity. I, to I worked hard on it. Uh, I'm pretty sure everything I have to say is in there. Nothing else you care to add? Well, I, just, I, I guess I'll repeat the, the second page, beginning of the second page, where the, I think it, it shows it clearly that uh, my neighbor and I, just our houses really are identical, except mine turned into a, a three family, I'm guessing maybe 30 years ago. And if you compare the two of us, we got the same house, we have the similar family, we all f have family living there. So one meter, one furnace, you know, and it just doesn't make any sense that I'm going to. I'd be paying an extra $400 a year for the next 20 years just because of the layout of my house. I mean, it'd be one thing if I was renting it out for real, and it's just not the case. It's, it's all family, just helping out my, my brother and my, uh, my ex-wife. What's the zoning place for your house? I'm not sure, because I'm right near that factory. Which the, factory? The Nelmore, or um, okay. where it's now, this, um, it, there's a gym there. I'm okay. like diagonal from there. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything that that prohibits you from, because it, it's how the assessors have their records that make a determination with the right. family. You can say, I want to change it from a three family to a single family. Mm -hmm. Because there, there are no restrictions on how many kitchens you can have or how many bathrooms you can have in a house. You can have all the kitchens you want, all the bathrooms you want. Mm -hmm. The only possible drawback is that if it's not zoned residence A, which allows three families, then your house is a pre-existing non-conforming. So if you were to change it to single family and then subsequently want to go back, you wouldn't be able to if it wasn't in I see. residence A. That I don't. No know. intention, and I, I don't see any disadvantage to you um, in you know, telling the assessors, you know, take it off the three family rolls. And, well, they, they, when I at first asked about that, because I pay a higher taxes yeah. and, and, and hazard insurance, they said, well, as long as you have the, the three meters, which I do. I have three meters. I bought the house with two tenants yeah. living there. Uh, and uh, I'd have to remove the stoves out of the kitchens. And Why? Th Why? This is what I was told by the assessor's office. They said you'd have to have the, the stoves removed, and you'd have to have the, the three meters taken care, of, taken care of, just have the one meter. The, the meter I understand. The meter I understand. The stoves, you can stoves have. Of, according to uh, Dave, you take is that's what qualifies it as another family. It's the number of kitchens that you have. 
there's another family that came before who had a, a two family who were taking out one of the kitchens because they never intend to use it anyway. So it's a stove they were removing. Um, which, uh, what's the address that you're um, comparing yourself to? Um, it would be an odd number going up. I um, have to say 65 or 67. It's the Stewart's. Okay. One more house down. I think the only thing that, you know, I, I could see where you'd, you'd question my whole situation is, you know, tomorrow my ex-wife and brother might leave and I could go back to renting the house out. And it would be really up to my me being honorable and saying, you know, now I'm back to taking in rent and this is officially a three family again. Uh, you know, it would be fair to put me back on that rate because this makes sense what, what you're doing as far as having each dwelling pay their share. But in my case now, I have all family, and I guess you'd have to rely on me being honest, saying, all right, well, in two years, my ex-wife moved out, my brother moved on, and here I am renting it out again. And that wouldn't matter because under our new zoning bylaws, the definition of a family is, quote, any number of individuals living and cooking together. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't say it has to be in one room okay. or the same kitchen. So under our new zoning, you can have 100 people and you can call it the 82 Main Street or whatever your address is, family, and they're members of the family. But then, then what, what, when does the definition of what it actually is come into the water bill? That, that's, that's, that, a that's a separate issue. And if, if the um, town is going by what the assessors have on their record, then it's simply a matter of convincing the assessors that it should be re-categorized as a single family. Mm -hmm. Um, if they're telling you that it goes by how many kitchens and how many um, uh, meters you have, I would, I would ask to see the specific state regulations that, that support that mm -hmm. rather than something, well, that's how, we, how we've always done it. Right. Okay. And if that's um, the case, then you have to make a decision whether you want to go do a one-way thing where I'd never be able to have it a three-family again? Yeah. Okay. Or, Depending uh, on the zoning, you too? Know, you might, yeah. You consider all those things. All right. Find out what the zoning is exactly. That's, that's new to me. I don't know about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, just if, you have, if you have a pre-existing non-conforming use and you discontinue that use for two years, then you can't go back to it. Okay. You see? That I don't Sorry, know. Carrie, you want to say something? Yeah, um, the neighbor that he refers to himself at 67 Rivolet, the Stewarts, mm -hmm. they're actually a two family. So they're paying, in, they two would cents. be paying for two yeah, also. I wasn't sure if they had changed the, the no, way they they're still a licensed two family. They're all family still there too. Yeah, so they're, um, yes, just so you, information okay. for the board. Okay. All right, thank you. David, you wanted to? I, um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did furnish the board with a memorandum that addressed this, uh, this situation um, explicitly. I mean, the, the bottom line is the CIFs are done by dwelling unit. And uh, um, Peter's assertion is correct. As long as it's considered to be a multi-unit building, then the multiple CIFs would apply. That was what the, that was what was explained to the board at the rate hearing setting, and that's what that's what's gone forward. So certainly, as long as it's a multifamily unit, that's really how, according to the rates that were set by the board, that's how it should be assessed. Um, the of course, any taxpayer does have the right to appeal this through the appellate tax board in Boston very similar to how an aggrieved taxpayer would do the same thing for a real estate tax valuation. But um, I, I really, you know, short of reading the mem memorandum, I don't think I really have much to add to it aside from that. Okay. What are the thoughts of the board? He just said, I, I, I just want him to remember if once, uh, I, once you call it a single family and, and two years go by, you can't, you can't go back there. Three is, that, is that dependent on zoning, which I don't know what I'm Yeah, well, you've got to see what you're yeah, zoning. I don't know that, so I don't want to make a final decision on something. Right. Yeah, I'm going to put the zoning map right now. So what would the zoning have to be? 
If, if it's residence A, that allows multifamily. Where's okay. Right? According to the normal. Where's the street? We can't check that right. now. But can you help um, me out? We have to go All right, residence A. Um, well, the thing is, even if the S I, I guess I would appeal to you that even if the assessor's office did call my place a three-family, which it is, when it came to the specifics of just the water bill, and just in comparison again to the neighbors, I mean, it really is all one family with one meter, with one furnace, with one uh, telephone line, with one cable system. Everything is single in this house. We're all family. I don't know how you could, as far as the water goes, call this a multifamily. I had a, it is. a building in Douglas. There were four, five commercial units and 11 residential units in one building. I had one water meter. I paid one water bill. So when they put in a new water tower, I was assessed $200 per unit. Okay, this is not Main Street. I know how it works. I, I understand. I didn't like it. Right. But was it all family, just one family living under one roof? No, these are all different apartments. Well, that's that's yeah. that's where my argument is, you know, as far as the water bill goes. Yeah. And if it I have matter how many families, because uh, whether it's a one family or not, you know, it's just set up in such a way. It's a physical layout of my house. Needs to recover the costs. And I you try to find the, what's the best way to do it, more equitable. Right. In general, mm -hmm. although it may not be equitable to a particular individual. I, I understand that total. So check, I suggest you check on those items and get back to us. Okay. Right. Well, uh, uh, um, I'll give Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Christian said, right? Yes. Um, uh, give me the option if you'd like us to, to kind of take action on this tonight or do you want to kind of confirm uh, you know what you've heard tonight, and then come back at, at the next meeting. Beverly and St. Andre. I'd like to try. I'd like to look into the zoning, and if it's something where it's a one-way thing, where I can't change it, I'm not going to change it. And I'll come to you right away and say, you know, if, make your decision on that, and then I won't change anything because what you're talking about is changing it even with the assessor's office to no longer call it a multifamily. Well, well, well that's it. Yeah, I, I don't want to speak for the rest of the board, but, but you know, I'd be inclined to, as long as it's recorded and recognized by the assessor's office as a multifamily unit to enforce the existing, you know, SIF structure. I, I'd be hard pressed. I mean, and, and I'm certainly you're, I'm sure you're a man of honor and you would tell us if the usage changed. But there are you know hundreds of other property owners that then would be lining up here to, to, to kind of I, plead I, the same same case. I saw that ahead okay. of time. Yeah. And, and that's 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 an issue because Sorry. there is you know no routine means of determining that uh, other than you know how the buildings are assessed. So I, I would ask you. I think it probably would be in your best interest. I think to uh, kind of you know cross the t's dot the i's on the zoning piece. Uh, pursue that change with the assessor's office if, if it makes sense for you to do that, mm -hmm. and then come back to the board. Okay. That's exactly what I'll do then. Okay. All right. I understand totally. Did you guys have? I thank you yeah. very much. Um, I found Rivolette Street. Are you north of Hartford Ave or south? Um, Are you by Robert Street, Beverly Ave? The Beverly Ave, yeah. Near Beverly Ave. That, according to the map, if you're above what looks to be the factory, is that the case? Um, can I see it? Yeah, sure. Sure. You would be in residential A. Hey. This is all, all the red is residential A. Oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in the red area. Okay, yeah. so he's in residence A. So that I, I double check with the assessor. Right, yeah. but the, right. Exactly, he, he can yeah. pull up your exact parcel and then, and then tell you, you know, down to the parcel, just to make sure. I mean, so if it's residential A, no matter what, it's gonna be a one-way deal. If I decide to do this, I no. will not be able to go back no. to no. no, residential no. A. That, Multifamily is allowed. Oh. Right. right. Oh. Right. That gives you right. the most flexibility, right. residential okay. right. aid. Right. I, I, I would just count it. Just double check with, with I the assessor. Double check with the assessor's office. We'll, we'll get you on the next agenda. On whether it's this, and then I can go from there. Right. All right. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Gee, it's nice to almost resolve something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we were that close. <laughs> Now let's get a company in here. <laughs> Item D, uh, fall annual town meeting warrant, sign warrant for posting and discuss, discuss motions. Um, on, your, on the table tonight is the warrant with all the citizens' petitions included, and um, the prior board wasn't comfortable with signing uh, something without seeing the, the completed document. So uh, here it is. We have 
seven signature pages, Kim? Nine? Ten. Ten, ten to sign. Um, what you see that's new, first of all, we have a 41-article fall town meeting warrant. And the citizens and petition, it's, we um, typing in the citizens' petitions, and those start at Article 27. So that's something that you haven't discussed in detail. You've seen them posted on the board, but you haven't seen them compiled into the document. And that's what we have before you. Can we proactively schedule the 18th and 19th for town meeting? I mean, there's absolutely no way you're going to get through 41 articles in, in an evening. I, I haven't even given the whole document to the moderator, so yeah. he'll be the one that will. Um, I, I just, I mean, let's, let's be realistic about this. We, we've had 12 article warrants and it's spilled over into two days mm -hmm. already, so. It's, it's definitely going to be a two day event. Maybe block out the rest of the week, I guess. Yeah. Um, if you feel comfortable signing it, if you want to take it home, we, we've pretty much proofed it. Um, what we did do is not change some of the grammatical or typos that were presented to us in the citizens petition a town council had said uh, type it in as it's presented so um, that's what we did mm -hmm. can i make some comments sure mm -hmm. uh, um, article 26 which is on page 11 uh, to change the charter to provide for an elected board of health in reading it it doesn't indicate when this is going to take effect. Now, I called Sue Smith and I brought that to her attention. Um, so if they want it to be effective immediately, then they'd have to have some transition period. In other words, the people who are currently appointed would stay in office until the election, then do something, or they could have it um, effective as of the election, the, the spring election, and then say that the one will be one year, one will be two years, one three years. So just make sure that when they get the um, in their motion, the motion that oh. they take care of that. Yeah, they had said they don't want to call a special election. They would be fine with it going yeah. on the May. That, anyway. that sounds that sounds right. Uh, no, I d don't remember Article Thirty One. The uh, elected Board of Public Works. Was there a, a time when that takes effect, Howard? That should be the same. That was, that was not considered to be okay. part of the article. It should be in the motion. In the motion. Okay, good, good. Um, and the same thing with 32, I suppose. Um, article 39, which is related to zoning, this is the power plant one. You should let the petitioners know that if the article passes to rescind the zoning recodification, then they need to change the wording, the references to various um, sections of the uh, five to section 20B and so forth that might have a different designation. I think that was all. I'm just double checking to make sure there aren't any others with that same yeah. uh, provision. So the motion, we'll say, we had motions last year, motion A or motion B, depending right. on the you know, yeah. Yeah, that's true. vote. Right. Yeah. You had to read them, Kevin, too. All right. Board's pleasure. Do you want to execute this tonight, or does everyone want a chance to review this in more detail? Well, the articles are the articles. Do you right. need right. questions? Some of the motions. Right, so right. I don't mind voting on it tonight if we can. I don't mind. But we're going to go through each one and. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's. Board of selectmen. Right. Our recommendation. But much, so. much closer to uh, to, to actual to town, town meeting, meeting, right? Because right. yeah, the planning board is going to weigh in on a lot of these and et cetera. So and, and, and FinCom is going to weigh in on every single article. So. Right. Kevin, before you start that, can I hand out my things here that I asked you about? Sure. Uh, I wanted to bring up one thing. I wanted to know, uh, uh, Jill, did you check into uh, preserving or conserving the uh, town history books? 
that are in the town clerk's office? I asked the town clerk to look into it, and so he said he would after the election and check with Upton as well. You had mentioned that Upton yes, did something Upton, that was Upton a good Yes, Upton has done it. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a report back from him yet. Okay, I had a concerned citizen ask me a while back to go, go down and take a look at BJ's, and uh, so I went down there. I went down there three or four different days. I guess this has been going on for a while. Actually, it, Bruce, just one um, uh, is this directly related to the warrant? If not, I'd just like to finish this piece of business, then we can. Oh move no, on no, no! It's not. A, it's not got okay. nothing to do with the warrant at all. Okay. The, oh, I didn't know he had one other yeah. thing. Okay. So, the, the, do I have a motion relative to the, to the warrant? Or do you want it words? Well, just. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I move that uh, we accept the warrant uh, with the articles uh, as written, subject to any um, uh, additions of dollar figures in the planning board and finance committee's uh, rulings on them. Yeah, those, those will be uh, in the motion. So the dollar figures in the motion. Okay. Yeah, so what, what exactly said. am I moving? So I think you should um, move to, to sign the warrant and, and post okay. it. I move that we sign the uh, warrant and, uh, and have it posted. Have it posted at the appropriate sites. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? I guess I just have a question. Yeah. Um, if we didn't do this, then what would happen? I mean, what's the? I mean, the world there, would come to an end. There, yeah, there, there's <laughs> town meeting would come to an end. I mean, it'd be so we, a very so short town meeting. We have no warrant to act state on. State law says we have to post it 14 days in advance. Our charter says that the warrant closes 60 days prior to town meeting. You could deliberate the articles until that you know, 14th day before the posting, but FinCom wouldn't be able to hold any other public hearings and neither would planning board. Okay, so, um, so if we don't, the, re the reason why I'm raising that is because it, it's still relating to um, article Article number six. I, I guess my question is, is, um, is it possible at this time to split that article? Or is that on town meeting floor? No, prior to town meeting floor. Is there a possible, can it, can that article be split at this point um, into two separate articles? Or is the only place that can happen is on town meeting floor? Your motion can be divided. Um, yeah, tonight yeah. you have the opportunity if you want to, if you don't like the commentary, if you want to delete that or, or put some extra uh, verbiage in it. Um, or, or you How can. How can you split it? What, what, there's only what, one thing. What would you split? The 13,000, it's comprised of the 11,000 for that 5% matching and then the 2,000 for the, the grant writing. I, that's what I presume that you're correct, talking about. Correct, correct. But not in the article. In the article, the total is 13,000. Yeah. That's what we're to make a motion. You could amend the article, amend the motion to change the 13 to 10 or 12, 11. Oh. <laughs> okay. Didn't we agree on 13? We agreed to leave it in. On, in at 13, article. right. Yes. But yeah, because it could be divided or reduced. reduced. Yeah, at you, town could, meeting. you could vote to uh, reduce it. In fact, the argument for not changing it to 11 was that the moderator may not allow it to be increased to the 13. But by putting it at 13, a motion to reduce the amount would, would be an order. I'm comfortable at 13. That's you know. That's all. I, that's all I can say yeah, about it. Motion could be made, you know, uh, to reduce it, to change the 13 to 11. I mean, I. Mike, this is my concern: is that. Um, my concern is that is there a chance that the moderator would not allow us to split the article and therefore it, there's it's not splitting the article no to just amending it amending the article to take it in two parts what what two parts the eleven thousand and the two thousand those aren't two parts you you make an, a motion to amend the article by changing 13 to 11. 
and there's discuss a second and discussion and a vote. If that passes, then the article is now 11, along with the 200 or whatever it is. If it fails, then it stays at 13, or another motion could be made to change it to some other figure. It's not splitting, it's not dividing the question. We get a grant of what, a $220,000, and you want to take 2000 away from the person that wrote the grant? I don't think that's fair. Well, there's... Uh, that, that's, that's a different issue. That's for that's town a, That is a different that. issue, right. right. That will... Procedurally, um, you, can, you, can, you can get what you want on the floor, make the motion to amend the article. And it, that's not up to the, the moderator to say, no, I won't allow that. All right, if the motion to amend is made, seconded, and then passes, then yeah. it's right. Any other discussion? But I just, I, I. Well, we'll discuss the merits of each article as closer to town meeting. Right. But, uh, There'll right. be more information for coming. Right. Okay. Call the vote. All right. Call for the vote. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Ten. We get E as part of the town manager's report. We Was did. It? There, there is a letter. Is action you wanted to. Right, but there is a letter in our packet, though, as well, relative to that. That was covered, though, wasn't it already? It, it was or covered it it, with, with Jill's report, but th there is a letter specifically in here. Uh, covered what? what? The uh, item E receive status of the of the PEC and its efforts to consider participation oh, yeah, in the yeah, GIC. Yeah. Deadline's October first. Uh, Jill covered that when she made her town manager's report. Uh, the letter is in the packet, so if anyone is. This one. Right. right. Which is less detailed than what Jill gave us. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, copies of the letter that, that I drafted uh, to, to be sent to uh, Representatives Callahan, Kajowski, and Senator Moore uh, are available if you guys want to see it. Essentially, uh, the essence of the letter is we're struggling financially. Uh, we want to be able to explore all, you know, Options relative to uh, uh, cost, you know, containment, mm -hmm. and uh, would strongly urge them to support any and all legislation that would increase the authority of the Board of Selectmen to make those types of decisions. Since we can enter into other health care uh, agreements on behalf of the town, it would only make sense that the Board of Selectmen also have that same power for the GIC. Okay. And um, also, one thing that may help with that with the PEC, it, you know, they had talked about. You know, majority of the members are in Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, showing a comparison, like for instance, Fallon. Um, a lot of the places that currently take Blue Cross Blue Shield also take Fallon. So um, a situation of having to go um, to PPOs or higher rate insurance may not be valid if your doctor, who your doctor takes Blue Cross Blue Shield and takes Fallon, it would it would have no impact to you um, on the actual individual. Um, you know, looking into some of those, and it may, it may speak also for Tufts too. I don't know. Um, for instance, Tri River. I know there's a big sign out there that says they now take Fallon. So, yeah. um, and, and Fallon doesn't limit you to St. Vincent's Hospital. In no, I mean Fallon. I go to if UMass. If you want to go to UMass, if you want to right. go to um, uh, Brigham and Women's or Dana Faber, whatever your case is, Fallon allows you to get that advanced care outside of their system. All right. All right, move on item F, uh, proposed town manager job description discussed combining the DPW superintendent position duties into the duties of the town manager and implications uh, relative to the charter. Uh, we put this on the agenda because we, we had you know, a fair amount of discussion about this at, at our last meeting. Um, last workshop. Last workshop, right, actually, that's right. All right. That's still a meeting. Still a meeting, yeah. <laughs> So, Carrie, I'll open it up to you. I mean, you, you seem to be uh, the key proponent of this. I'll open it up to you for any further thoughts beyond what we discussed at the last workshop. Um, well, first of all, to make sure that, you know, um, I threw it out as an idea, um, you know, something that um, 
basically, you know, we were we are in the position, um, and I've taken this. I'm looking at it from this point of view. We are about ready to hire a new town manager, and we're looking at hiring a new um, director of the a new superintendent of the DPW, and um, during the interview process with the DPW, it, I learned that there are towns that have this as a dual position. Um, we're in a financial situation in town. Um, so, he, you know, is this something that the town should be looking at? Um, combining two salaries um, into one, and if so, um, what are the pros and cons to it? Um, and that's how it came out, and that's where we're at. Um, what I left was, and when I came in, I provided to you all, I just did a quick, of some of the towns that we were referring to, um, their populations, um, their amount of households, their population density, I've kind of given you a breakout of, you know, whether they're a town administrator or a town management style. Um, how many people are on their BOS, just to give you an idea of the size of their towns. Um, what they have as far as their DPW, is there an assistant or not? Do they have water, sewer, trash? Um, and some other things that I just kind of pulled off. This information came just by going on their websites and looking at their personnel is where I got it from. Um, and then you'll see those are just a couple of questions that I wrote as I was kind of going through it. Um, who does, in, uh, and I don't know if we covered this or not, but um, who does Uxbridge use as their engineer? Because we don't, from what I can tell, we don't have an engineer, which was something that some of these other towns are relying on. We contract out. So for water and sewer, we use Tita and Howard, and um, Megan just solicited proposals. Um, I believe Gray Graves is also going to do our, our DPW engineering. Previously, it was Beta. Okay. Um, you know, and that's something to figure into the cost. You know, if we're, you know, if we have a director, we're also paying for a contracting of an engineer. You know, is this another area that we could be looking at cost savings for the town? We didn't. We we didn't be contracting that out anyway. Well, no, not if you had an engineer on staff, you wouldn't have to contract out. You, you would generally for the large projects. So they use an internal engineer and an external engineer? Um, yeah. We, they, we haven't had an engineer on staff, I'm not sure how long ago, but definitely Larry and Irving weren't. They were well versed in you know, driveway slopes and meeting the, the you know, curb cuts so they can do that type of inspection to make sure that the developer would, you know, made the appropriate cut, but they weren't laying out roads or doing typical engineering type of work. And, and to do the kind of work that we contract out requires not just an engineer, but an engineering support staff to do, generate all the documents and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's more than just having the technical knowledge, you have to have the, as usual, people to actually do the work. <laughs> right. I mean, like I said, it, you know, in going through the process of, you know, sitting on the panel for the um, looking for a superintendent for the DPW, um, you know, and then looking some of the other requirements that there are in other towns. Um, I mean, one thing that stood out to me, and in the in the candidates we had, no, I mean. The candidates that we provided to Jill as a recommendation to hire from, they are not strong in water and sewer. Um, and that's where kind of the thought process came if the director who we're looking at paying, you know, possibly $80,000 a year is not strong in water and sewer, and then we're relying. What is he strong in, or she, or whatever it is? Um, that management skills, um, traffic. Uh, their backgrounds were more on the department side 
um, the traffic department side than they were on the water and sewer side. What, what's the traffic department? That's mm, the highway. The highway. highway oh, okay. Right, right. That's where their expertise was coming from. Um, this is just the thought process that I was going through. Then we're going to be relying on our department head. Well, if we're going to be relying on our department head um, for the knowledge and the expertise, then couldn't we do that on both sides of the house? And therefore, seeing that, um, for instance, the town administrator slash DPW that was helping us with the interviewing process, he did both those roles. So here was an opportunity to maybe look at why don't we look at something like that? Yeah, but they had a population of they had a population of seven thousand eight hundred forty-seven. Yeah, but they also had a greater population density of six hundred forty-two compared to our four hundred twenty-three. So I mean, they dense population you, is easier to serve. That's right. Um, right. You found one one I, jewel, I guess, maybe. I, I guess the most telling argument supporting uh, Carrie's position on this is the fact that we currently have the same person doing both jobs here in town, and the world hasn't come to an end yet. Who is that? Jill. Jill. Well, is she really doing both jobs? I mean, she, things are going along. Right. But. Um, so if things go along quite well without a superintendent, do we really need a superintendent? Well, if, if that's the case, then that begs the question, why wasn't that a suggested reorganization two years ago, two and a half years ago? Say, well, listen, because I can do that job, fire that guy. Well, because <laughs> we had somebody in that position and we weren't in the place to actually stop and say, okay, now, we're, now we have a chance to reassess things. I would do that. If I was the, the boss and I had somebody that was in the department head, I can do that job. I'd say, hey, I like you a lot, but take a hike. Well, two years ago, or was it a year? Yeah, not this town meeting, but the prior town meeting. So what, that was a year and a half ago. There was a argument on town floor to eliminate the conservation commission position. Um, there was somebody in that position, and we did not eliminate it. But as soon as that person left the position, we restructured that position. So here's a situation. We don't have anybody in the DPW director position. That's a good time to assess and look, do we need to reorganize, reorganize this position now? We didn't We just hired a contract Contracted person it out. rather than a... a um, Another full-time... Uh, right. We, we, we went from a full-time position yeah. to a part-time position yeah. to contracting it out. Yeah. So, but we looked at it as people left. We didn't kick somebody out the door. And that's, that's all I'm saying is we're looking we at here. The power is in government. We don't do that tough. <laughs> well, that aside, I mean, that's all I'm saying is here's a chance to just look at the process. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't mind. You know? okay, one thing that jumps out at me here uh, on your little summary table is that in Millis, where the town administrator is also the DPW director, mm -hmm. they do have an assistant DPW director, whereas the other four towns, I mean, we don't now either, but um, did not have an assistant DPW director. So that person would kind of be the de facto, probably D DPW director for the more nuts and bolts aspects of that job, I would imagine, with the town administrator perhaps just doing you know, higher level administrative functions, that kind of thing. Um, I'd be more apt to uh, try to go down the path of, to, having a discussion, do we need an assistant DPW superintendent in a town our size? Um, you know, as opposed to, should we combine the DPW director and the town manager positions? I'd be much more prone or, you know, you know to exploring the second step of that, which is, do we, do we have enough work to justify an assistant DPW supervisor? We don't have one now. Uh, well, right, exactly, because right. of resignation. And again, this is, a, as you just mentioned, Carrie, this might be an opportunity to kind of take a look at that process again. Keep in mind, it's not budget. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, budget, it's not budget, budget anyway? We okay. took care of that yeah. already. Okay. There's, there's no assistant DPW supervisor. That's already, that's, that position's been eliminated. Okay. Budget right. so, so this would be a no, then, in, in, in your right. table here. <laughs> Both Gilchrist, who was uh, Irving's predecessor, and Irving were hired with the idea that they would become the superintendent. I mean, that was a notion. Um, so it wasn't, to my knowledge, anticipated that we, we would always have an assistant uh, DPW superintendent. Right. 
I mean, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, yeah, there is, when the town administrator is running the department, there is an assistant for the smallest town, but if you look at the two towns that are larger than us, they, they have an engineer running the department and there is no assistance. Um, you know, and I, what I find astonishing is the largest, <laughs> the largest town out of them all has, they have a superintendent for the water, um, a superintendent for the highway. They also have a landfill that they're dealing with. They have no DPW director. The town manager, they have an engineer, and they have a water sewer commission, which we have on the warrant article to actually establish a water sewer commission. So we're going to be picking up a category right there. Oh, I live in that town. So only the sewer commissioners are elected, but the, the engineer was a former DPW director, and the highway superintendent does very high-level stuff. So they're not, they, they, they have more administrative-level positions than we do here. Okay. Sometimes titles are misleading. You have to go right. beyond that and see. Yeah, that right, I, right. I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm throwing this out for discussion to see, you know, you know, are we making what's given all the factors right now? Are we? Well, if we were to make a DPW director appointment now, mm -hmm. um, does it have to be a three-year appointment? No. No. Right. Would it make more sense to do a shorter, shorter duration? And then if we do come up with a situation where, you know, the, the, the town manager walks in the door who also has all the skills necessary to perform this function, then at least we'll, have, you know, we'll only be locked into to a year with having both roles. You know, no, I, I don't so know. So who would take the job? Well, and, and, that's the, and that's the challenge. It's the same challenge we're going to have with the town manager position. Is, mm -hmm. or, you know, with, with the only a one-year contract, is anyone going to you know, even apply for that? So we'll find out. Well, that's why, that's why I had that extra six months in there to cover a fiscal year. Well, that six months, that's, that's what I wanted for uh, not only probation. It was just the six months to get caught up caught up to what's going on here or try to get caught up to what's going on here. So in reality, it's a year and six months. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a year. Right, or a year and five, yeah, five months, a year and five. Yeah, f year and five months. Right, okay. So what's board's pleasure on this? I would like both town manager and a DPW director. Um, I mean, I, I guess my question is, is, are, we got winter coming up. You got to remember that. No, I understand that, but what's that have, have to? have a abolishing winters. <laughs> okay. That'll take care. Of I would long love long. to have. I'd love to have the sun come come here. Is oh, that a motion? Time. Abolish yeah, winter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, maybe. I mean, See, what's the feeling? Uh, I, I guess I have. I guess I'm concerned as to, um, you know, maybe we need to go back to the table then for the two candidates that we currently are looking at. I mean, if they're, if they're not heavy on water and sewer, I mean. We have video, somebody on water We and do, sewer. but what happens if somebody happens to that person? We have another person under him that has the same license. Okay. Um, now remember, we haven't finished the recruitment process, right. so um, because Bob's on vacation next week, we've had a delay when we're going to meet with the two candidates, because uh, I wanted them to meet with the operations managers. So that's right. going to happen on the 30th, mm -hmm. I believe, in the morning. Um, the DPW superintendent, you know, was hopefully going to serve as a facilities manager for, you know, the, the town-owned buildings, the tree warden. So there were duties that I was hoping to add to that position that are currently either not being done or held by somebody else. So if you, and I'm, I'm not supposed to have any input in this, but if you feel your next town manager can do all of that, then, I mean, that's the route to go. But we're looking to really um, bump up the DPW superintendent and make it a little more expansive. And do you feel you can, st I mean, um, 
the salary that we, you know, the, the 80000 that we're not going to go above that figure. No, it's only budgeted at 80000 right. okay. so, And then it's split. It's split, I think, 30, 30, and 10. So the two enterprise funds uh, pay a portion of it, and then the DPW admin gets charged a portion, and that's the general fund portion of it. Okay. Um. I, I guess, yeah, my overall sense on trying to combine these roles is you're going to take just a pool of candidates and, and just really restrict it, I think. You know, if, if someone bubbles up that they can do both, um, that's kind of a trump card you have in your back pocket, you know, as, as things unfold over the course of the next year or two. Um, I, I wouldn't want to set that as our target, though. I, I just think, you know, unless the guy from Ellis, you know, wants to come work here, um, you know, the, the, yeah, I, I don't know that it's realistic to hope for you know, that combination a of skills. Of the actual yeah. person. When Mike Rona was superintendent, he was superintendent and he was a business manager. It wasn't until after he left that now we have this other position, expensive position of a business manager. So and I work for free, so I'm the DPW superintendent without a fifty thousand yeah. dollar increase. Sorry, just set me up for that one. Well, we've right, been asking we the new town manager. Too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're not getting paid. Um, I thought it was sixty. <laughs> so I mean, like I said, I threw it. You know, it's just to stop and make sure we're on the right. Okay. You know, we're on the path that we want to be on before we jump into something and go, why didn't we think about that? Just make sure that we, we have, we hire somebody that we're not going to be stuck with for a long time. That, you know, we can see how they're going to work. You never know until you see how things work out. Well, it, how good they are. True. I mean, was there an actual time frame advertised I don't remember there being a contract link. There's a there's no contract. It's not a position that qualifies under MGL, but there is a six month probationary period. That's they work or they don't. You don't have to give any explanation or anything. Yep. And then we have annual reappointments. That if someone's not working out, you give them you know three months notice and say this isn't working after that probation. We have good. I think we have two good candidates for DPW. Well, one of them we one of them. Um, had qu the qualifications, I believe, for Tree Ward and also. Yes, yes. One of them if not does. both of them did. I know one of them definitely did. And that's what Northbridge does. Their DPW director is the Tree Warden. So. And uh, we asked, I think we asked the other one, he said he would have no problem getting certified. Right. So there would be two of them. Can you lift 30 pounds occasionally? Ah, uh, yes. They both look like they, they, they both, could lift. They both <laughs> Sure, I don't want to tax them now. I mean, 30 pounds is a lot of weight to have to live, okay, lift occasionally. If they wear work boots, we're in trouble. No, you got, I think we have two, two good men. Right, let's move on. All right, um, <laughs> under new business, uh, we, we, we had scheduled a discussion on the policy for uh, meeting notification. Can we put that on just, just given the hour uh, of, of, the, uh, of the ending? I, I know Bruce wanted to bring up a new item under just in business as well. Yes, as long as um, next time then um, we can have two because there's a, another policy that um, um, they, that I'd like to propose um, that we address so that yeah. we could have two on but the next day. Let's talk about that under item seven then. Kevin, I can, uh, I can agendas. say this until tomorrow. We also have a policy that we it's on the agenda for tomorrow. But well, I mean, well, it's not <laughs> on the agenda for tonight. But, but, <laughs> I don't want to break down. You, you can introduce it, and then uh, we can talk about discussion of a future agenda item. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want me to go ahead and so, so uh, go and introduce it, and then uh, I'd like to kind of wrap, wrap up tonight. I have okay. four items that I okay. again I'll, I'll defer them because I want to go home. Right. Yeah, uh, that's what I said. I'll do it. We need to control the meetings more, and we ask a question of somebody, and they go on for 20 minutes. Um, you know, you need to say. I mean, you have no trouble telling members to, you know, keep it short, but we seem to, and it's not just you. All chairmen have had the same same problem. Somebody gets up there and they go on and on and on and on, um, and the time just flies when you're having fun. Okay. <laughs> okay, I just uh, just to let you know I had a concerned citizen come to me and uh, ask me if I checked this out down at BJ's warehouse. Uh, according according to that person, this has been going on for a while, and uh, I took 
three days myself and went down there at odd hours of the day and it seems like they had their own fleet of vehicles and according to their I don't know what you want to call it, contract, their agreement with uh, Uxbridge Mass, the company financial contribution to the town, i.e. property taxes, motor vehicle excise taxes, water and sewer fees and all that. Now they got, these are down there all the time. There's 29 to 30 of them and I got pictures and I'll just hand everybody a, did you just, what, did you just hand these down? And uh, there's one for the soda now that they hit the floor there too. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> but, but what's the issue of those? Uh, they should be. Uh, they're all licensed out of Maryland. Okay. Yeah. And they've been in the. Uh, they stay. They stay in the yard at BJ's. I got a picture of all of them, and yeah, I got the, the license. It's similar to the everything. school bus issue that you yeah. had, had raised years ago. Okay. Uh, about if they're being yeah. stored being, predominantly okay. in our town, then they should now be. Now that's uh, you know we. There's 29 to 30 trucks all the time. They got sleepers, they got other trucks, but there's 30 of them. You take an excise tax on them trucks for, for 30, the town is losing a lot of money. The question, who owns the trucks? That company. doesn't matter. After, after they're in the state for a certain period of time, they have to be registered in the state. That's nice trucks, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. No, no, I, I guess my question, I, I mean. Hey, keep going, you'll see. It's a side shot of the truck. Yeah. Keep yeah. on going. Them are the sleepers. They look like they're all brand new. No, they're not too old. And that's one from the Connecticut. One got hooked on thir uh, Thursday. Yeah, one got hooked on Thursday and replaced it with a Connecticut truck. That's the Maryland license plates. All the other ones are Maryland license plates. So I guess the question is, is BJ's is renting their space to a... No, I'm going to trucks that pull the BJ's uh, boxes. Because I follow one in, right. into the yard. Well, well right, but, go BJ's, in the yard, but. but BJ's has a... BJ's... Okay, I used to audit BJ's. Um, and they, they don't own the trucks. They, it doesn't matter if they own them or not. They're being housed in Uxbridge. They're supposed to have... Occupancy license plates and pay an excise tax. But I guess that the was question is per their agreement with Oxbridge anyway. That's why I have this thing here. I didn't copy all of it, but that came from the assessor's office. If the trucks are here in the state working out of South Oxbridge, they have to be registered in Massachusetts. You can't house them here. No. I, I can imagine that BJ's claim is going to be these trucks make deliveries to the BJ stores in Maryland. They come up here, pick up their payload, deliver it to Maryland, and that's where they're quote unquote based. And that's gonna be the argument I'll tell you right now mm -hmm. but that we're gonna hear. I can tell I can tell you I watch them I watch them come back too. Okay. And they're all people from Rhode Island driving trucks. Most of the people are, are from Rhode Island. All this says is they they're gonna give us a report stating various things, and one of which is the company's financial contribution to the town, i.e. property taxes, motor vehicle taxes, and so forth. Giving us a report. Well, I know it. I'm just. Does not obligate them to garage the vehicles in the town of Oxbridge. Right. Uh, pay the excise tax. But if they're garaging them, But if we could build the case that they are indeed, you know, based here, then we certainly would have. Yes. And they've been there for a while. Okay. So this is not you, just this week. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. We we can certainly in, investigate investigate this matter further, but unfortunately, one of the issues that that comes with any of these companies that operate in multi-states is not only do you have the lease agreements that are involved, but then you have the claim of where the vehicle is principally garaged. Generally, they use their corporate headquarters, even if that's not the fact. The question is, how can you prove that they are spending their principal amount of time in the municipality? That's, that's where the issue is, especially where you're dealing with a multi-state jurisdiction. So it, it's very, very common that, that companies such as this will choose to register their vehicles in whatever state is most friendly to them from a tax 
standpoint. That's right. So, which I'm guessing is not Massachusetts. Uh, probably not. So, I mean, I mean, we can we, we can certainly do some general inquiry and mm -hmm. and get back to the board with a little more well, information. I, you know, I, I guess the, the easiest way to determine this is uh, over the road. You know, truckers have to keep a log mm -hmm. of where they are, what what time, what day, et cetera, as they because the taxes they pay are based on how much time they spend in various states. Right. So wouldn't it be just a simple matter of if the largest percentage of the time is in Massachusetts? And that I don't know if that's what counts or whether they, the details escape me now, but at the time of the issue with the school buses, I delved into the RMV regulations regarding garage. I, I don't remember the details. There may be some wiggle room there. The same way that people can determine where their principal residence is, right. voting premises. You can have 10 right. houses. I'll be Mrs. McCain and have 11 houses. And know. you determine which of those states will be your principal residence for voting purposes. So I don't but, know. But now you guys wrote it into the contract, though. That was a contractual. Right. A a after, after you uncovered this, then yes. when the contract was re-upped, yes. that became a condition. Yeah. But they, they, didn't you tell me today in 2006 they paid two? Uh, they paid two. They paid and those two. Are, those, by the looks of it, look at their, their valuation, those are on-site vehicles. So something that's not leaving the state would certainly be required to, to go to mass excise law. But every state has its own set of excise laws. So mass says. They're in, in garage here, and I know. Right, but that's what, Massachusetts, that's what mass law says. But these, if these things are traveling to different states, they don't necessarily have to conform to mass general law. They do if, it, if the thing's sitting there all the time. But where it's, it's I've been down there for a from week. state to state to state. You go down there right now, I guarantee you'll see 29 of them. But the same trucks? I got, I got the serial numbers on the side of them. It is okay. I got the DOT number. Yeah, it's, if you go back a week later or two weeks later. Or yeah, two weeks later, they're all there. They're all the same ones, except for the one from Connecticut, because on Thursday they pulled one out, Dorenzo Towing on 146, pulled one out, and they brought in a one, a one from, from Connecticut. That's the only Connecticut one there. The rest of them are all Maryland. Is the, is the garaging, is there a certain time frame? Well, remember the, gar the whole concept of garaging is unique to mass general is not unique to mass general law but is is part of just determining which municipality in Massachusetts gets the dollar you know for instance if 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 i live in one town but my for whatever ve whatever reason i leave my vehicle in another town and i register and say this is where i principally garage it i'm going to pay the excise to that town um, once you're dealing with multi state jurisdiction that that does no that no longer applies because you're not trying to divvy up which town you're paying to you're trying to figure out whether or not Uxbridge has the claim and to do the only way to do that is to is to look at Maryland excise tax law and see what their statement is what what their issues are as to whether or not it has to be registered there because of a corporate headquarters or if there's just a tax benefit so it's a little harder once you're you're dealing with multi-state vehicles. That's what we're going to have to. I mean, corporate, we corporate headquarters into. is Natick, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Not uh, right. Not Maryland. The corporate, yeah. All the bills, you know, the bills for the two in town are going to Natick. Right. right, but if BJ's doesn't own these trucks, they use a transport lease company. Then the distributor corporation could be in Maryland, therefore Maryland law yeah, could true, be requiring. Absolutely. If Cowan is based in Maryland, then. Right. But there's still, what, there's still garage in them here. But, but if, if Maryland law, which would be the question, I think what you're saying is and that Maryland, right, well, and that may be a different situation, but if Maryland law says that the corporate headquarters is here, therefore they're saying that's the principal place of business, therefore they're claiming if you register in Maryland, you can't claim an excise tax in Massachusetts. Right. Excise you can't the be excise in tax right. isn't it isn't countrywide. That's you know, you don't I have just, the same standard. All I want to say is I, I was asked to look at it. I looked at it, I presented it to the board. 
Yeah. And I'm going to continue to look at it. So how, I guess the question is, is then how do we, right. how do we go about finding out yeah, whether or not they're in violation? You, do you have any yeah. recommendations? I, I, can, I, can take, I can look into it and get back to the board. Okay. I'm trying to get us a little extra money. We, we, don't, we can't get a business, so why don't we get some money from somewhere? <laughs> but a toll goes by in there. One there you go. There you go. <laughs> you said you have four, four things real quick? Yeah, but not today. I'll, okay. I'll defer it because I want to go home. Okay. Can we revisit the policy that we don't meet past 10 p.m.? Sure. Okay. Be happy to. Okay. I we have a lot favor. of yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of policy <laughs> procedures. <laughs> okay. uh, Actually, there was just <laughs> a thirty-second <laughs> item. Yeah, um, we, we did get a complaint uh, relative to the, the, the ZBA. I, I did see an email. Uh, today from, from the town manager I, I would just ask that uh, you know we be prepared to kind of brief the board as to what what the process would be that we would follow um, to, to act on this type of complaint okay it was in our reading file but I, I saw they forwarded that to the ethics department mm -hmm. okay and they're the ones that resolve those issues in fact if any of you have questions about any ethical issue you call them and they will call back and Give them the information. I'll send it to them. Right, they'll give you a definitive answer. The charter provides for suspension and removal, and that's that's different than. Okay, so okay. can we just get a full update at next meeting? Mm -hmm. If there's any additional information. Sure. Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? All right. <laughs>